My latest video got 400,000 views. How much money can you get for me on another video that would get 400,000 views? It depends. Since 2017, I've earned over $1.2 million from sponsorships on this YouTube channel. This video is a long form conversation with the man who deserves probably the biggest share of the credit for that, my agent and also the CEO in the company that I co-own, Nebula, Dave Wiskus. Dave and his team have booked over $100 million in sponsorships for over 200 creators over the last 10 years. That includes me, as well as a lot of my friends like Legal Eagle, Tear Zoo, Mary Spender, Philosophy Tube, and a whole lot more. So my goal with this conversation is to create a hopefully comprehensive guide for both getting sponsors interested in your channel if you're a creator, and also for negotiating better deals with rates that you deserve. Specifically, we're gonna talk about how to know when your channel is ready for sponsors, how to attract brands, how to price your early spots when you're not really sure what your content is worth, and how to negotiate higher rates over time so you're actually getting paid what you deserve over the long haul. At what point? Can I work with brands? If you look at views from subscribers and it's 5%, you don't have an audience yet. We'll also talk about whether or not you should sign with an agency and what to consider, what to ask them if one reaches out to you. Now, those are just the broad strokes. As you can see, this is a pretty lengthy conversation. So there are a lot of other insights and topics that we cover. And I wanted to talk with Dave specifically about this because as far as I know, Nebula Talent is the only creator agency out there that actively pushes hard for data from sponsors to actually tell creators how well they're performing and help them negotiate rates that are fair over time. Before I started working with Dave and with Nebula Talent, when I got my first few brand deals way back in 2017, all I knew was what the agency representing the brand was offering me. I had no idea what their cut was. I had no idea how well my spots performed for the brand over time, which meant I had no idea if I was getting paid fairly. Additionally, those agencies didn't actively represent me, which meant they had no obligation to bring me deals, and I had no idea when my next brand deal would come. Once I started working with Nebula Talent in late 2017, that all changed. Not only was every single video that I wanted sponsored actually sponsored, but I got performance data, which meant I was able to see which videos were performing well, which videos could be improved, and whether or not I was getting paid fairly, which meant that my rates started rising over time pretty quickly. For example, because I'm pretty transparent with my sponsorship pricing, when I started working with Skillshare back in 2017, I was getting $2,000 per video. Now I get $15,000 per video. And in this conversation, you're going to learn how that pricing actually works because spoilers, it is not based on views. It is not based on subscribers. And it's not based on a lot of the metrics a lot of other people and gurus on Twitter and here on YouTube will say you need to pay attention to. It's all about value and you're going to understand and what constitutes that value in this conversation. One more thing worth noting is that our actual product, the Nebula streaming service over at nebula.tv, became one of YouTube's biggest sponsors in its own right last year. And we currently spend about $500,000 a month sponsoring creators on this platform, which means that as the CEO of Nebula, Dave has the rare distinction of having deep experience both as a talent agent representing creators, negotiating with dozens of different brands over the years, but also as the CEO of a company that sponsors creators. He has deep understanding of the metrics that these companies actually look at and care about. So you're gonna be able to benefit from the insights that come from both of those experiences. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Dave Wiskus. All right, I'm gonna jump right into it. Yeah, yeah. My latest video got 400,000 views over on the Thomas Frank Explains channel. How much money can you get for me to put a sponsor on another video that would get 400,000 views? It depends. Okay, on what? Uh, a million things. Uh, <laughs> it's your channel. Okay, so we know something about you. We know something about your audience. We know something about how people respond to you. Uh, this is on, wait, which channel? The Thomas Frank Explains channel. This, okay, the second channel. The big old Notion channel. Slightly different audience than the main channel. Mm -hmm. So we know nothing other than these are people who like you probably. We don't know how many of those viewers are return viewers right now in this conversation. Sure. We don't know how many of those views are from subscribers. We don't know on average how many views come from subscribers. We don't know what monthly views look like. We don't have any past sponsored data to work from. So the answer is, how much do you want? Well, I'll go ask for that. Can I have $400,000? I'll ask. Okay. I'll, I'll go to the, the sponsor factory and I'll say, can Tom have $400,000? <laughs> is it what, a dollar per view? That's. I'll take a dollar per view. That's ambitious. I don't think that's ever been done. The truth is that we know a little bit about your audience. We have some sense of things. 
your uh, handsome bearded white guy giving life and productivity advice. The audience responds to that in a different way than they would to a voiceover channel. If, you're, if you made the same video, same script, but you weren't on camera, that would play differently. The audience wouldn't attach to you in the same way. A lot of what your sponsor rate comes down to is how attached is the audience to you. In your case, fairly attached. Uh, we've seen from mutual friends and from folks out in the world, people who I know who, uh, when they realize that we work together, they'll, they'll talk about, oh, I watch all of his Notion videos. We know that there's like an association there for you. Mm -hmm. But that's context that I have because I know you. If you were just to come to me and say, I have a video that's likely to get 400,000 views, how much money? The answer is like, I don't know. So views do not correlate to dollars directly. There can be a correlation, but it's not a direct correlation. And if there is a correlation on a channel, which th there often will be, like the way one channel performs relative to its views on, you know, on a normalized scale, it will look as if there is some correlation between the dollar amount or some causal relationship between the dollar amount and the view count. Mm -hmm. uh, that's misleading. Most likely what's happening is you've just got normalized views over a, a, like your, your sponsor performance was here and your views happened to be here. And then later, both of those numbers went up. That doesn't mean that one caused the other. Mm -hmm. It just meant that they both happened to go up at the same rate or at the same pace. So basically for a given set of other factors, audience affinity and connection to the creator, the product being promoted, the topic, the format, views can correlate with sponsor rate. Some sponsors are gonna work better for a viral view video, mm -hmm. and other sponsors are gonna lean heavily for parasocial. If we, if we think in terms of you, something like a Skillshare, mm -hmm. you are there in your videos primarily telling people not how to do things, but you're a little bit like there's productivity advice, there's context, there's, I wouldn't call it how to, but there's a lot of like how to think about how to. Yeah. Because people are coming to you as a, uh, an either subject matter expert or uh, like sort of a spiritual guide for productivity, uh, it's really easy to assume that that audience is an audience who wants to better themselves in some way. And that is an audience that lines up pretty well with Skillshare. Uh, at the end, if you segue into, and another great way to learn about camera placement or lighting or whatever is to watch this great class I found on Skillshare, blah, blah, mm. blah. Then the audience who sat through that, even if it's their first video of yours they've seen, they're kind of primed up. Right. And they might be much more willing to follow that thread one step further and click through. Uh, so a viral audience might play for you. If that video really blows up, if it catches fire, we'll look at why it caught fire. Mm -hmm. That video might have gotten big because it did a really good job of capturing uh, an answer to the question that the person was asking when they found it. And then if that spreads and the algorithm robot puppy puts it in front of more people who have similar questions and even not knowing you, they feel satisfied with how their questions were answered. In the end, it's going to spread out, it's gonna spread out. And the end messaging segue, the virality of that video can be a plus for you and for the sponsor. Right. But if you're pushing something like Nebula, if the call to action and the primary selling point of the sponsor, Nebula, is come sign up for more of me, early access to me, leaning more into the parasocial, then a viral audience isn't really gonna care. They don't know sense. you. They don't know you enough to care about you. They don't know that they should care about you. Or even something like, let's say, brilliant. Maybe the, the video, the topic of the video doesn't line up so perfectly. Still a great sponsor in general, mm -hmm. but maybe it doesn't line up perfectly with going and learning about STEM. Because you're talking about right. cameras and making videos as a, a side hustle. And then you're like, well, and you can learn about physics. Well, that's not really what I was here for. Mm -hmm. So some section of your audience might be really into that. But the largest chunk of your audience, the audience for that particular video, may not be. I guess before we get into everything else, I do want to draw a parallel there. Because when I made the video for my paid Notion template, Ultimate Brain, when it hit 100,000 views, we estimated that it had driven 65K in sales. So wow. Like, getting close to that dollar per view mark. But the way I look at it is very similar to what you just said about uh, if we you know, are talking about something that the audience is already very primed for, they, yeah. could, they could come into one video, have never seen me before, and still convert for a sponsor because they are already interested in the thing that the sponsor represents. Right. And I see that reflected in the template video too, because anybody who's clicking on that video sees you know, in Notion in the title, they're already primed 
to want to use Notion and ideally to want to improve how they use Notion. So even if they don't know who I am, they're like, well, I'm already primed for this tool. Right, right. So I'm primed to convert here. Yeah, that's an audience where you got to think about what is the logical next step. You have to imagine when the audience sees this sponsor read or when they get to the end of this video, what is their logical next step? What do they want to do next? Right. At the end of a video about uh, making videos as a side hustle, what is the logical next step for, for the person who finished that video? Mm -hmm. Well, a pretty strong case for logical next step is learn more about making videos. You're obviously interested in the topic, mm -hmm. go learn more. You watch a video about Notion and how to do amazing things in your life with Notion templates, you get to the end of that video, the logical next step might be to get some uh, Notion templates from the expert who just made the, the video that you watched. That is how you get a, a, a bigger chunk of the people who finish the thing uh, to click on the, the sponsor link and, and make a purchase, increasing the, the conversion count. If the logical next step is go learn more about Notion, but what you present them with is let's learn about physics or subscription coffee, <laughs> yeah. uh, then it's like some subset of those people will be interested in subscription coffee because they just were, or maybe you mentioned coffee somewhere in the video, or maybe you have a really great segue. Like, yeah, I, if you're making videos as a side hustle, you still have your day job, right? And it takes a lot of time to put these things together and you might have some long nights. I always did and that's why I drink whatever coffee and you should buy some. Like mm -hmm. that's kind of a way to fake a logical next step. The smooth segue thing is about creating a logical next step. Sometimes it works really well, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the name of the game is often just like making sure that the thing that you're promoting has some actual relevance to the audience. Something I would like to touch on a bit later is how you do that in a, a way that doesn't compromise the integrity of the content. Uh, because that was something that I was always worried about. Back when I first started working with you in like 2017, uh, I was worried like if I put brilliant on a video on how to do better in math, mm -hmm. it's going to compromise the integrity of the video because the sponsor is too close to the video. Right. And I've sort of cooled on that, but I think a lot of people also are going to have the same question. Uh, ideally, the kind of people that I would want watching this video who <laughs> have their yeah. audience in mind first. Yeah. Uh, when you think of integrity, a lot of it comes down to the integrity of the creator. Mm -hmm. And... So much of what a sponsorship is, is, uh, is just trust. You're not selling airtime on your video. Right. There's a cheaper way to get airtime on your video. It's called AdSense. Mm -hmm. If somebody just wanted airtime, they would do that. What the sponsor is buying is trust. They are buying access to the trust relationship that you have with your audience. So when you, at the end of the video, say, I really like this brand of subscription coffee, it wakes me up in the morning, I feel great, and I have lots of genius brain ideas. Uh, they believe that that is true and that you mean what you say. And over time, if you're promoting ways for them to improve their mental acuity, if you're promoting tools that they can use to improve their lives, if you're promoting services that help them enhance their skills and develop professionally, you build a rhythm of trust with your audience that you are only here to promote things that bring them benefit. So right. when you get to sponsor number 60, sponsor number 70, uh, there's a couple of ways that can go, right? One is you promote uh, a service that uh, dubiously purchases maybe a plot of land in a foreign country to get you a fake title that nobody will ever care about. That sounds, on the face of it, like either a dumb novelty that is harmless or a scam. Even if it's just a dumb novelty, do you want to be the dumb novelty guy or do you want right. to be quality products and services guy. Yep. Like you've built up this trust and now you've just done, done something that can erode it a little bit. On the other side, if you get to sponsor number 60, 70, whatever it is, and you make a video about you know, making videos and at the end you're promoting the new Canon C something or other because Canon saw your previous video about making videos and they decided to sponsor you, mm -hmm. then the audience isn't thinking, this guy is a sellout shill who's right. just going to take money and put whatever random bullshit he wants to in front of me. They're thinking, this is high quality sponsor that benefits me guy. And if he did a deal with Canon, this must be pretty cool. Yep. You need to be seen as being selective about that. That buys you out of the ethical question of why is this kind of sponsor sponsoring this video? Mm -hmm. The other side of that though is like, 
if if you are a creator who only makes videos about Canon or about cameras and about reviewing cameras, and then you do a Canon sponsorship, your credibility for everything else is shot. Uh, yeah, so the difference would be like, here's a channel where I review cameras, right. and then I take a sponsorship. It sort of erodes my non-biased yeah. opinion. Whereas yeah. if it's just like, I'm gonna teach you lighting setups, I'm gonna teach you sound, like I'm gonna teach you the craft of filmmaking, mm -hmm. and I take a sponsorship from Canon, it's different because it doesn't uh, erode the integrity of editorially what, what I'm doing. Yeah, because at no point will somebody need to worry mm -hmm. if, if they're coming to you for a question of which camera should I get, mm -hmm. and sometimes you are saying Sony when they're paying, and sometimes you're saying Canon when they're paying, it's like, well, which one actually is better? Will he lie to me for money? Right. That's weird. If you've always said, or if you've made videos in the past talking about your camera setup, and then you get to this video, the one time you're promoting an actual camera, and you say, uh, here's my setup, this is what I've always used, this video is sponsored by Canon, uh, they want me to talk about this great new camera, it's got these features, it does these things, uh, and this is what I've always used myself, that sincerity matters. Right. Because that really is what you use, and that's gonna carry through to the audience. But it's gonna be a combination of time and relationship maturity and how much trust there is between you yeah. and the audience. And you gotta be really careful not to sacrifice that for a paycheck. So what I want this to be is ideally like the one-stop shop guide for the creator who either wants to work with brands eventually or is starting to get approached by brands, maybe yeah. even works, you know, I'm gonna put a lot of uh, expectations on your plate. Sure. Sure. <laughs> and obviously it can't be, you can't be all of that. Um, but I want, to, I want to at least cover a lot of the questions that creators are going to have. Well, I think the, I'll just call it out. There's going to be a lot of it depends. And, yes. and I should disclaim up front that I work with uh, a collection of creators who work within a collection of genres. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of genres out there like uh, beauty or vloggers or comedy channels. There's a bunch of, of, of genres that I've never touched. Yep. And they might have their own rules in their universe. And I acknowledge that. Nothing that I'm gonna say here is necessarily a universal truth. Mm -hmm. So as long as we're okay with that, I'm happy to answer anything. Yes, and I, I will put my favorite quote in the universe out there up front. Bruce Lee once said, adapt what's useful, reject what's useless, adapt what is specifically your own. Uh, use that as your North Star <laughs> for anything you hear here. Because yeah, like you've worked with, uh, going on 180, 190 creators. So, uh, total I've ever worked with? Probably, probably over 200 at that point. Yeah, yeah. So over 200 creators, um, 10 years of booking sponsorships for creators. You've worked as a creator yourself in multiple genres, and now being CEO of Nebula, uh, we're one of the biggest sponsors on YouTube at this point. I yeah. think, what did you say, like 500K spend per month? Yeah, yeah, uh, and sky's the limit on that because mm -hmm. of how quickly the the revenue returns, so it's like everything is everything is built by numbers. Everything is built on data. So yep. like, get more data, spend more money. Get more data, spend more money. Mm -hmm. It's uh, yeah, it's weird to have seen so many different facets of it. I've sat in so many of the different chairs, um, and not just as a content creator for video, but uh, across medium, a podcast or professional musician. So kind of getting a sense of how different uh, sharks and different waters operate. Yep. Um, I've, I've, I've certainly become skeptical. Yes, <laughs> and, and I've uh, firsthand seen a lot of these sharks, um, <laughs> have worked skepticism. with some of these sharks, uh, and then met you in 2017. So, you know, just to cover the bona fides here, I think like since meeting you in 2017, um, I've made 1.2 million in sponsorships. You're welcome. That's all, yeah, I mean, it is, it is through you and Standard, so thank you. Well, I mean, <laughs> we're, we're uh, that, that's money you earned. I, I do, yeah, I do that. understand that I did earn it, the sponsors wanted to work with me, but like, mm -hmm. uh, you and Standard and all the team, you know, behind Standard are in part responsible for that, and in part, I think, responsible for uh, helping me to navigate the path and, and make it sustainable over a course of five years. Um, until I, you know, at least temporarily stopped working with brands last year. Temporarily, you say? Yeah, I mean, this is going on the main channel. It might be sponsored by something. We'll see. So anyway, yeah, you've been working with me for six years now. We have 180 creators currently being represented. Um, 
I think like that. you're the person that I would want to talk to if I was building a resource for creators coming up wanting to know how to navigate these waters. It would be so weird if you didn't want to talk to me. <laughs> After everything you just said, if you're like, you're third on my list, I'd be like, oh, shit. Okay, so I, I sort of divided my mental outline into chapters of the creator's journey. And the first one is obviously like, I want to work with brands. Yeah. At what point can I work with brands? Like how big do I need to be on YouTube? Or, yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah, this is, this is one of those early days questions. Um, it depends. Okay. There's no, there's no single answer to this, generally speaking. If, if somebody recommends a channel to me and I, I take a look at it and I see six months of posting history and they're getting 20,000 views per video, my reaction is, internally is they're not there yet. If I see 50,000, it's maybe. If I see 100,000, like, okay, we're about there. But even then, the view counts, views don't really matter. Mm -hmm. The view counts aren't super representative. They're just like a, you got answer this question, like there's this collection of creators, like how many have this? Okay, that shrinks the pool. Okay, how many have this? Shrinks the pool, this shrinks the pool, shrinks the pool. So those concentric circles, the first filter is view, average views per video. A couple things you can get out of that. If I see that you've got 10,000 views, and then 100,000 views, and then 2,000 views, and then 500 views, and then a million views, you're not a million view channel. You're a 500 view channel. Mm -hmm. and, and some other stuff happened along the way. And so you're saying the lowest view count of recent videos is representative of what you think they're likely to get? Uh, future I, ones? I would say if I see a wide range, I'm going to be wondering why. Okay. And if I see that you've got one or two videos with a couple hundred views and then one or two videos with a couple million views, but you've got a couple hundred subscribers, that leads me to believe that maybe uh, the million plus view videos were either a fluke or you're just starting to break out, which matters. They could be perfectly, this could be your new normal, but if it's your brand new normal, you might still not quite be ready for sponsorships yet. There's a difference between the audience and your audience. The audience belongs to YouTube, and you can already buy access to that through AdSense. Mm -hmm. Your audience is the relationships, the trust relationships that you have fostered, you have grown over time, people who will listen to what you say and take your advice on things, who, the people who will stick through to the end of the sponsor read and are more likely to buy something or to sign up for something yeah. in part because they trust you and in part because they want to support you. That desire to, to be a part of your story, parasocially uh, involved in your success, mm -hmm. let's not discount that. That is your audience. The audience, the, you know, a couple million views, that's the audience. That's YouTube's audience. How many of those are yours? Well, if you've got six videos, only the two most recent have a million plus, and you've only got 500 subscribers, then I'm going to guess probably about 500 of those people are actually your audience. Right. So it's not a question of what... What is it worth? How much is a sponsorship for a couple million views? The answer, the, the question is, how much is a sponsorship for a couple hundred views? Mm -hmm. And the, these things, if, if we don't know much more than just those numbers, we have to go by the numbers. But if you dig in and you see uh, that on these latest two videos that have over a million views, a lot of them are return viewers or uh, watch time is really high, that might tilt things or it might mm -hmm. indicate that good things are happening. But there's, I don't know, there's just so many data points behind the scenes that you would need to look at to really understand it. Um, but that first, that first filter, that first litmus test is, do I see a consistency and a trajectory? Okay. So consistency, trajectory, going upward, building that core audience that comes back for you, mm -hmm. has trust in your channel. If we're looking at the back end, and we're on YouTube, so we're gonna use YouTube as the example here. Sure. What are the metrics that a creator should be tracking and looking at most closely to determine, you know, this is starting to pick up steam, yeah. I'm starting to become attractive to brands, whether as, uh, you know, me reaching out to them or, you know, looking forward to the time when they might become, be coming to me? Views from subscribers. Okay. Uh, take a look at the channel, views from subscribers over the last 30 days. And, and this may even answer an upcoming question like, when am I ready, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at views from subscribers, let's say you're getting half a million views per video, and then you go into views, uh, percentage of views from subscribers over the last 30 days, 
not percentage of watch time, percentage of views from subscribers over the last 30 days, and it's 5%, you don't have an audience yet. Okay. You're building one, you're in build mode, and that's awesome. Mm-hmm. To an extent, you'll always be in build mode. Get used to that, live there. But if you don't, if you've not built your audience yet, 5%. Or can we say more precisely, that is your audience? Like if it's 5% views from subscribers, maybe you do have an audience. Like maybe you had 2 million views in a 30-day period. Like 5% is a decent number. Then. Yeah, you're gonna, you want to look at uh, percentage of views from subscribers. You want to look at how many views came from the subscriber tab. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you want to take a look at how many return visitors you have. The, the, that'll give you a sort of general sense of how many people are coming in for you. Uh, versus if it's all from browse features or from search, God, if it's all from search, you got nothing. Uh, really? Yeah, well, I mean... I might want to debate on that one. It Well, anything can vary by genre. Okay. And productivity might be different, mm-hmm. or how-to content might be different. Uh, but generally, if somebody goes into search, they're looking for an answer to something, they get to you. Right. If you've got tons of search traffic but no return visitors, what's your audience? You mm-hmm. might have... Uh, something magical, uh, uh, a really great answer to the question uh, about logical next step Mm. that a certain kind of sponsor would be really, really grateful to be a part of, Mm -hmm. but you don't have your audience. If nobody watches more than one of your videos, that is not your audience. Mm. You can still capitalize. Like I say, if you you have uh, how-to guides on woodworking or something, um, uh, do-it-yourself, homeowner repair type stuff, people come in for that, they get their question answered. If the logical next step is go to Home Depot and you have an ad for Home Depot at the end, that might be really effective. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it doesn't necessarily mean that that person is going to buy a Thomas Frank fix-it t-shirt. Right. So it seems like you're almost building a distinction between when a channel is ready for very specific kind of sponsors, which I think is... And correct me if I'm wrong, but is, is a much harder question to answer generally. Well, even if you're doing the, the Home Depot ad, you still need views. Right. And if you're getting a couple hundred views per video, like why would Home Depot want to yeah. sponsor you ever? Yeah, and that one makes sense. Like if it's 200 views a video, you're probably not going to get hardly anything. Yeah, and that's why um, the, the trick with any of this, like it's such a complicated flow chart. And like yeah. what I'm talking about here is hand wavy and specific to certain genres. And again, right. I don't I don't want to mislead anybody into thinking that there's a single clear answer. There mm-hmm. just there, there isn't one. Um, there can be for certain genres kind of, but then there's like, are you on camera? Are you not on camera? Did you have high camera production value? Or does it look like it was shot on an iPhone and poorly edited? Mm-hmm. All of these things will influence Sometimes in surprising directions. You would assume that this is the better in every category, but sometimes shooting something on your iPhone makes it feel more relatable. Right. Or like we saw, um, like Lindsay Ellis used to do very ironic ad reads. Right. And then they would do <laughs> quite well sometimes. Yeah, like she, uh, what was the one she did where there was like a, a big rant in there or an entire video, I think, about Squarespace? I think there was, yeah. And then uh, it ends with, and then go sign up for Squarespace. Mm-hmm which uh, did really well, and the audience <laughs> loved it, so great, everyone wins. Right. Yeah. So uh, to come back to the point, there's like, I guess there might be a distinction we can we can make between uh, a channel that is ready for, let's say, let's call it a general slate of sponsors. Mm-hmm. Like back in my channel's heyday, if you want to call it that, it was a sponsor in every video, and we had a, a decent rotation, and they were all sort of something different. Right. Versus now... Um, yeah, I feel like Thomas Frank Explains may have broken past this at this point, but say six months ago, anything that wasn't Notion or a Notion tool probably wouldn't perform that well. Right. Because it's like, we did have uh, a, a huge percentage of our views from search. Before? Yes. Uh, now but- it's mostly browse, but it was like, I think it was the, the top thing was search for right. a while. Probably because people are looking for answers to specific questions. Mm -hmm. They come in, they discover you. That as a discovery mechanism is fine. The question is not how did how did the viewers get to you today? It's how many of those people are getting to you for the second time, the third Mm -hmm. time, the fifth time. And I don't know if you can see that level of granularity. But there's certainly what was the content of those videos? I mean it's all how to. 
everything's how to. Right, right. Uh, how to what? How to build a habit tracker, how to open links with a different <laughs> URL handler, like sure, sure. from very broad to very, very technically, te uh, technically niche. And then w the, the end of that video, who's the sponsor? Me. Always me. Right. Yeah, there's, there's never been a sponsor. Here's how to do these things. Here's how, here, I am an expert. Here are the systems you need to solve problem. Mm -hmm. You have problem, you will find this video. People search, they find this video because they have that problem. They watch because they have that problem. And in the end, yeah. logical next step, here's a tool you can use that helps you solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Of course that's gonna do well. They're already there for Notion or, or, or habit trackers or whatever. They, here's, here's a handsome bearded white dude uh, who, who seems like he knows what he's talking about. He's confident. And he says these things and he's got a really well thought out system. I want to be like that guy. Mm. I want to be that uh, put together. I want to be that thoughtful about how I comport myself, go through life, build my systems. Mm. And at the end, you're saying, and here's a tool I'm going to sell you on how to build a system like mine. Hell yeah, I'm signing up for that. So that makes sense. Mm. Logical next step. So there, there's a useful insight there. People find me because they're searching for, I want to build a habit tracker or notion. They don't care that it's me. They don't know who I am half the time. Right. And then basically you're saying they're watching the video initially to get that answer. But then, you know, by virtue of the way I look, the way I speak, the way my set looks, how professional everything looks, there starts to, I start to build a connection there. You, can, like, like you win their trust quickly. Yeah. And this is sales, right? Like right. you go into a, a, a car dealership and the guy who's got the uh, schlubby, ill-fitting suit and the, the, the bad comb over is probably not going to be as compelling a figure to you as like a really cool, handsome guy, like a James Bond vibes. This guy knows what's what and he's probably going to all the cool clubs and whatever. Uh, you're going to kind of favor his opinion on which car is right for you. Right. This guy over here, it's like, I don't know, I read the the car buying guide and I, I went on the internet and it said I should get mm -hmm. this Honda Accord, so I'd like the Honda Accord, please. Whereas this guy might talk you into a sports car because he's cool. That makes sense. Actually, my, my wife recently went to a tailor to get a suit jacket she bought tailored and she came back and she was just gushing about the person who helped her and she's like, I just want to be this guy's best friend. Mm -hmm. So very good example. I feel like uh, he probably could have sold her a Skillshare membership mm. pretty easily. Maybe he should have. <laughs> Maybe he should have. Okay, so coming back to the sort of view thresholds that you were saying, like 20K average is probably not going to do it, 50K maybe. This is, this is super generalized heuristic, and it seems like it is primarily for your benefit as an agent that has very limited time and resources in terms of like your ability to go out and find brand deals for 180 creators. There's instincts, I think, that comes with experience. Okay where I can look at a channel, I can see high quality thumbnails, uh, view count is trending up, uh, might be early days, but they're clearly putting in the work mm -hmm. and the audience is, is definitely starting to catch on, um, but average 50,000 views. Okay, That's interesting. If I go in and the channel is five years old and they've been putting out a video every week and the thumbnails look like shit, bad typography, bad composition, uh, they just keep cranking stuff out, huge fluctuations in view counts, but the average is 50K, meh. Gotcha. Because one of these people is on a trajectory. One of these people is putting in the work. The other one thinks that they've found success because the number is just big enough to make them think that, Right. but they're not doing anything to build it. Mm -hmm. They're in like maintenance mode on their view count. That makes and sense. so like, uh, they're probably cycling through audience or they have exactly their audience, but they're not attracting anybody else in. Mm -hmm. So they're not gonna be, from a sponsor perspective, you want like you want a churning reservoir of mm -hmm. core audience. Because like on any given video, there's a reservoir of people who could potentially sign up for the sponsor. They could uh, potentially be convinced to sign up for that service. And then of that, there's a smaller group of people who will sign up for the service. But you go all the way out, it's like the people who watch the video, the people who watch it to the end, 
the people who actually watch the sponsor read, the people who think the sponsor read is interesting, the people who click, the people who buy, or you know, some version of that. What you want is for with every video, you are pouring more potential in at every stage of that, mm -hmm. even down to the, the people who watch all the way to the end, it should be to some degree a different group of people. And you can have a, a situation where 200,000 people watch every video you make, but you get uh, 1,000 conversions for a sponsor every single time. Mm -hmm. You would think conventional wisdom would be if it's 200,000 people and you're getting 1,000 conversions, you got 2,000 of those, right? At best, you can do that. Or, uh, oh. two, two, uh, 200, 200 of those. Times you could do that. Yeah, you can do that 200 times and you've run out of people. Right. Uh, or more likely, you're going to hit a point of diminishing returns along the way. Mm -hmm. This time it's a thousand. Next time it's nine fifty, and then it's like nine twenty, and then and then and then. That doesn't happen. What is YouTube if not a machine that goes out and finds you more audience? Right. This is what the algorithm does. What doesn't find you an audience? It finds your video for the viewers who would like it. But from a practical perspective. How many new subscribers do you gain when you post a new video? You would expect that the number of new subscribers gained mm -hmm. on a 200,000 view video, that, that, that could be any number. It could mm -hmm. be a few hundred, it could be a, a few thousand, depending on the channel. So a couple of things are happening there. One is that the pool is constantly being replenished. It's right. not the same 200,000 people watching every video. Yeah. That's absurd. It's a different group of 200,000 people every time. Right. And there's going to be some people who watch every one. There's going to be a larger group of people who watch every other video. Yep. Or an even larger group who have missed the last five, but then the algorithm put this in their, their recommended feed mm -hmm. and the thumbnail looked good and they recognized that it was you, so they clicked. Of that, most of your subscribers don't watch every video. And most of your views don't come from subscribers. So what is yep. your audience? Your audience is sort of a rotating cast of people who have seen some of your stuff. Right. You are not Game of Thrones. You are not destination viewing for a large number of people, and it's better off for everybody if you don't fool yourself into thinking that every one of your subscribers is sitting down the moment you post a video with a bag of popcorn and clearing their schedule to watch whatever you just posted. Right. It's YouTube videos are a crime of opportunity mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. So some things are destination viewing. I'll stop what I'm doing for a Patrick Willems video. I'll stop what I'm doing for, a, I don't know, an Alt-Shift-X video, speaking of Game of Thrones. But there's plenty of other creators who I love their stuff, but I might miss a video or two. And then maybe later I'll go back and I'll do a little binge. And these things are all valid. These things are all perfectly good ways for audience to uh, discover the things you make. But very few people are like so in love with you that they're going to sit down the second you post and watch it. Nobody is, uh, I don't say nobody, but largely the audience is not full of completionists who have to go through all of that. Right. So if the cast is rotating, the cast of, of the audience is rotating, if the waters are constantly churning, then you don't have 200,000 people and that's the limit. Of that 200,000, some of them are never going to hear of you again. Mm -hmm. Some of those people have no idea who you were. They just watched a thing and they moved on with their lives because who cares? This wasn't for them or it wasn't such an important and compelling thing that they feel they need another one right? for whatever reason. There are other groups there. Some, some subset of that is people who are seeing you for the first time and will want to see the next one, but they're not in the group that's ready to buy. Right. On the next video or the next video or the next video, they might be. Mm -hmm. So we can define the audience not, and I think this is important, not as your subscriber count, Super not that. Uh, I would say out of my 3 million subscribers in this channel, probably 2 million of them have been gone. <laughs> They're like, you know, they graduated college. They don't want the college tips anymore. They don't care about productivity anymore. Um, so, How you know, there's times? a pool of people that are just kind of out of my life. How many times have we been together and you've been recognized and somebody says, I watched your videos uh -huh. all the time in college? I mean, literally two nights ago, 
at the restaurant, yep. the waiter was like, yeah, I watched your videos in my freshman year. I really liked them. Yeah. And, and I'm graduating now, so I don't need them anymore. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. Yeah. He, he sort of graduated out of the audience. Yep. And then it's up to you. Do you want to keep appealing to this demographic or do you right. want to broaden it out? And those are decisions that you'll make as a creator. But his feedback wasn't negative. It wasn't, I liked you, and then you started to suck, so I'm out. It was, yeah. this served the thing, that this served the purpose that I needed it to serve, and I'm grateful to you for that, even if you're not currently a part of my viewing habits. So I, I think this is important. Like We should define, like your audience is this very nebulous group of people who are familiar with you and who are, to some degree, willing to watch your content that's coming out now. Right. So, you know, between the people who watch every video religiously, the ones who watch here and there, the ones who just like see a video pop up and they recommend it every six months, that's your audience. I would say, I, I would distill it to your audience is the group of people who watch your videos on purpose. We can hand wave it at that. There's gonna be asterisks and footnotes all right. over the place, but roughly speaking, people who, who Watch your videos because they meant to. That is your audience. And so on YouTube, you're saying the way to get a rough picture of that is to go into your analytics and look at views from like returning viewers? Yeah, look at returning viewers, look at views from subscribers, anything that is a metric that hints this person watched me on purpose. Okay. Not found this video and watched this video on purpose, but watched my video on purpose. Mm -hmm. People who came back are a pretty good example of that. Gotcha. At least as a starting point. Subscribers, yeah. obviously, there are people who are uh, watching on, pur on purpose. But the trouble with subscriber count now, or views from subscribers now, is that uh, the the like recommended feed is front and center. Even me, a hardcore sub feed mm -hmm. user, I don't use it anymore. Well, I looked at my views like from the sub feed on Thomas Frank Explains, and it was 0.2%. That sounds about right. And if I went to my entire channel's history, not the last 28 days, I think it was 1%. So, wow. so I think views from the sub feed doesn't really say much anymore, but the number of returning views you get, mm. I think that's much more compelling. Yeah, yeah. And uh, all of this is a little bit mystical. Right. We're, we're trying to read tea leaves. And, and so, like, no one data point is the thing. No one item in analytics is the thing. Mm -hmm. Views from subscribers is pretty good. Right. Uh, return viewers, pretty good. Return viewers is pretty good for establishing, like, how much audience do you have. Uh, percentage of views from subs over the last 30 days tends to be a pretty good metric for figuring out, like, whether you're ready for sponsorships or not. Mm -hmm. Anything under about 20%, maybe not. Okay. Uh, Twenty percent to fifty percent is the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. The closer you get to fifty, the better your sponsor rate is probably going to be. Um, once you hit fifty and above, it's hard to go over fifty because if you're at about fifty, if half of your views are coming from people who were subscribed, that's a lot of subscribers giving positive signals to the algorithm. So it will reward those signals by going out and finding more people. I see. So that 50% number keeps growing, keeps growing, keeps growing, so the algorithm fills up the other 50%. Yeah. If you've got this growing, but the algorithm brings you nothing, it means that only subscribers like this video and nobody else cares, and that's a problem. Right. So 20 to 50% is about the target range. Uh, over 50, 55 maybe percent, and you start to have troubles if like, 100% of your views are from uh, subscribers, it means that the algorithm was showing your videos to people and nobody cared. Gotcha. So on, on to pricing. Oh boy. <laughs> the, the even harder topic. Um, I'm this gonna... is the most common question I get. Yeah. How much How can much you can get me? Yep. How much can you get me for a video? So I want to, I want to dig into the question of how much do you charge when you're just getting into this? Uh, but I first want to jump forward and sort of like set the stage. When I was doing sponsors regularly, I had a sponsor in every video, which was between two and four videos a month. Every sponsor rate was ten to twelve thousand dollars, like extremely consistent. Yeah, that's pretty good. And I mean, and, and you you booked these. How? So, uh, what were the view counts like? Right around fifty k. On my channel? Mm -hmm. No, we we're like a hundred and fifty okay. to three hundred k. Okay. Probably. I, I'm remembering. I think when we first started working together, your view counts were lower. Yes, they were a little lower. I think I was probably breaking 100 or getting close to it when we first started working together. And when we first started working together, um, th this will be a, a question to come back to, but 
the first sponsor rate you booked me was actually lower than when I had first worked with that brand directly. And there's a reason for that. But I want to first establish, like, why was my sponsor rate so consistent for years? Like $10,000, $10,000, $10,000, every video, even though the view counts would fluctuate like crazy. And I imagine the conversions would fluctuate like crazy too. Well, the view counts, uh, who cares? Like there's, there's an audience, your audience, who will watch your videos. The people Mm -hmm. who watch on purpose, that's probably not fluctuating very much. The collection of viral views that the algorithm will bring you, that, so here's, here's your audience and here's the audience. And the audience will fluctuate wildly. Your audience is probably going to be fairly steady mm-hmm. to within a margin of error. Uh, we see this all the time where a creator will panic because they think, well, this probably bombed for the sponsor because the video way underperformed. Then we'll look at the data and we're like, no, I actually did a little better than usual. Mm. And it's like, wait, how is that possible? I'm like, well, let's go into the analytics. Okay, well, your views from subscribers was higher than usual. Mm. So while it didn't catch algorithmic fire, uh, your audience really liked it. Like your audience clicked through. Your audience saw the thumbnail and watched the thing. Mm -hmm. Others didn't. So you're not really growing your audience on this video very much. But like your audience did see it and they clicked through and they signed up at roughly the same rate. I'm always amused and fascinated at the consistency from video to video to video. You would think that the number of people who want to sign up for Nebula or whatever uh, from this video to this video would be a wildly different number of people. Right. It isn't. It's super consistent. I've also been really fascinated with that on the sales side. Like sales of our products are usually pretty even from day to day. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, how is it the same number of people decide they want to buy a template today yep. as they did yesterday? Yep. Like I don't get it. <laughs> but yep. it just somehow works out that way. And, and web traffic seems to work the same. It's like you look at your analytics and Maybe sometimes you get a viral spike or you have seasonality, but day to day, it's usually like within a a fairly tight range. Yeah. Like we look at Nebula signups, just like just the analytics for Nebula signups. And I know that a Wendover video, I can expect roughly this many signups Mm. per day Um, with, you know, it's day one, this and day two, day three, day four. Uh, And then uh, maybe a Cinema Wins video goes out or a Neo video or a uh, Lindsay Ellis video was released and like I, I kind of know per creator what what those chunks look like mm. and so I can look at the like a one month span of signups and I can see with with remarkable consistency like oh here's where m- more creators posted videos and then here's where people were like just as a collective, everybody was working on their scripts or like trying to get something out the door and then suddenly at the end of the month it spikes back up again because everybody finally right. like, rushed their video out because they knew that they had a deadline. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can see the ebb and the flow of it. And it's not because like, oh, like on these days, these people performed particularly well. It's like, no, just, you put the money into the machine sponsoring the thing. Um, and this is the perspective as a sponsor. You put the money into the machine and you know roughly how the creators are gonna perform so seeing the spikes and the dips really come down to how many sponsorships ran that day. Right. Not did this creator nail it or did this creator underperform? Because mm-hmm. there, there will be variances. Sometimes there's a dud and sometimes you just knock it way out of the park. Uh, but those tend to balance each other out. And okay. so from a sponsor's perspective, it's about normalizing the data as much as you can. Think about like a portfolio. You're not booking one video from one creator. You're booking a collection of creators you're booking a, 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 a tranche of videos from a collection of creators and you're doing that uh, repeatedly because you want to, we're playing baseball here, right? We want as right. many at-bats as possible. We want to play as many games as possible. And over that, you can see where the trends are. You can predict better. And you can get a better understanding of what a given player's performance is and you can optimize for that. You can build for that. You can try to find the markers that would help you identify who another great player might be. But it's not about, I'm a sponsor, I give you the money, you go out, it's a dud, therefore I never work with you again. It might affect how much I pay you for the next one, and certainly will. Um, But at the beginning of the relationship, it certainly will. Uh, But it doesn't mean I'm blacklisting you. Okay. It doesn't mean this guy sucks, we never want to go there again. Mm -hmm. Unless the answer is just zero or... 
um, comically lower than what you would expect for margin of error. And this is this is another point of confusion, I think, where creators will will go in asking for astronomically high rates. To your question, like why was it so consistent? But but also like the, the like ten what was it ten to it's like ten to twelve thousand right. dollars was almost always the rate. So ten to twelve k, uh, but the first one we did lower. Yeah, I mean when we started working together, I think the first spot we ever did was two k. That's not. Uncommon. And then it went. 4K, 7K, 10K, like up pretty quickly. Not uncommon, uh, in, uh, for a handful of reasons. But uh, one I'll address here in this moment is that if you go in at 2K and overperform, the sky's the limit for you in how much that sponsor is going to love and trust and be excited to work with you again. Mm. That doesn't mean you should intentionally discount. Um, like we made a best guess based on data and there's other stuff. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, you, what you want to do is make sure you're not going in too high. Right. Don't go in too low. But if you have to choose between too high and too low, pick too low. Because low is going to dazzle and create a great first impression that makes them want to work with you again. Yeah, you're building a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is, if you're, if you're doing it right, this person is somebody you'll work with again and again and again because you want them to keep giving you money. Right. Do you want $10,000 once or do you want $8,000 a month forever? Mm -hmm. Right? Like this is the balance. You could probably go in and convince somebody to give you 20 grand even if you're only worth 3. But if you know you're worth 3 and you say 20 and they pay you 20, you didn't get a good deal. You sold your own future. Right. At a discount. Don't do that. So it's more about don't don't go in with too high a rate that you're, you're ensuring that they don't want to come back and work with you. You're building a relationship. You want to make the marketing person look good in front of their boss. You should be the easiest decision they ever made next month and the month after that and the month after that because they know that whatever their target is, whatever their KPIs are, uh, key performance indicators, typically cost per acquisition, how much they pay to acquire a new customer. Okay. Let's say it's $25. They want to spend $25 to acquire a new customer. There's going to be some influencer out there who has a giant ego and uh, a hardball team, and they convince the brand it's got to be some crazy number. And they say, worth testing. And they pay that money, performs at $300 per conversion. Sponsor's like, all right, not doing that again. Right. Uh, and then they just don't make the call. They don't call up and say, well, you. Did you way underperformed, let's do one cheaper because mm -hmm. they probably know that the response to that is going to be no. Yeah. Uh, look, why waste the time? Why waste the energy? And the creator is probably not calling up and saying, how well did that one do? Mm -hmm. And if they do, the answer they're going to get is it underperformed. And to them, that means, oh, I'd have to take less money? Never mind. I'll just go talk to somebody else and quote my astronomically high rate again. And for some creators, they can do that. They can move from bridge to bridge to bridge lighting fires and they think that that's success. Mm -hmm. They think that because they got 10 people to pay them $20,000 for a $3,000 video that they are now sitting on a mountain of evidence that they're worth $20,000. They're not. They're when in reality somebody. they're yeah. just sort of tricking brand after brand after brand into thinking that this is going to be worth it. Right. So and no value is really delivered. Right. And what's going to happen in the end is when they complete that cycle and they're looking for another sponsor, suddenly they're not going to have one. Right. Or you can keep finding new sponsors, I guess, or doing outreach to other types of brands and making something happen. Or maybe after a year of sitting there, that first video finally had caught up to performance, and maybe it's worth testing again. Maybe from the sponsor's perspective, like, it's within test range, so we'll try, and maybe the audience has grown. They do it again, same results. I'm like, oh, burn that bridge. And so uh, it's really easy to, to mistake or view count for audience size and then let that trick you into thinking that you're worth more than you are mm -hmm. or people paying you that much. It's easy to think that because somebody paid you that, that you're worth that. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not. So going back to the question of consistency, the, the answer basically is even though there's variance in performance on each individual spot, the brand is looking at it as in, as you know, this is within standard deviation. This spot didn't so horribly underperform that we think 
the next bet is not worth it, and they're basically just looking to normalize over the long term, as long as the relationship seems like a good one and has long-term prospects. Yeah, and there's, there's secondary factors. Like, one of the things that we look at now, when we're booking creators to promote Nebula, we, like, yeah, obviously we're looking at CPA. We want to spend this much money and we want to have this much money come in from those new customers. Otherwise, we're just setting money on fire. That's not right. a good way to run a business. But there are sometimes creators who they underperform a little bit, but their videos get so much watch time on Nebula mm -hmm. that we understand that the value of this creator might not just be in how many signups they get, mm -hmm. but in how long the retention curve is for mm -hmm. the customers who stay. If somebody signs up for Thomas Frank, and then you keep promoting, and they stay for four years, so we have a lifetime value of four years, that is good for us. Right. The value of a customer went up, so the CPA can kind of go up. Okay. If somebody comes in and signs up for you, and then no matter what we do, your lifetime value is two months, it's not just so about, things get even more complicated, because right. you can look at your average lifetime value of a customer, but if the people I bring in stay right. a lot longer. Right, that so okay. that, that CPA number, the cost per acquisition CPA, that is how much I want to spend to get a new customer. Uh, KPI, key performance indicator, which mm -hmm. are like, here is what drives us, here's how we build our campaigns, these are the numbers that we care about. So if my KPI is cost per acquisition and I wanna spend $25, how do I get to that $25 number? What magic formula tells me that $25 is the right answer? Mm -hmm. Is it because the service costs more than $25? Well, that'd be a dumb way to do it. Yeah. Uh, it could yeah, be. employees and overhead and everything. Right, right, right. Uh, for us, you take a look at how much the service costs. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, so if somebody signs up, nebula.tv slash Thomas Frank, uh, if they sign up for a year, they're paying $30. If they sign up on the monthly plan, they're paying $5 a month. Mm -hmm. So if they stay for a year on the annual plan, we get 30 bucks. If they stay for a year on the monthly plan, we get 60 bucks. Yep. So you would think we want you on the monthly plan because we make twice as much money. Except, except they don't ex stay. Except <laughs> people who come in, uh, people who come in monthly don't typically stay as long as people who come in annually. Right. Uh, those people, you know, you can't cancel for a year. You keep checking back in as you're reminded of it, even if you don't watch every week or every video. Uh, so you get reminded of the service, that the service exists, you come back, you check something out, and over time it sort of becomes routine, and then when it's time to renew, it's like, yeah, let's keep that going. You've had more time to kind of uh, get invested or get bought in as this part, uh, being part of your routine, and for a service like us, you get to see the ways in which we grow and change and expand over time. For the monthly folks, doesn't quite work that way. They might decide, well, they watch the thing they wanted to see, they'll cancel the next month so they can save money. That's right. perfectly fine. But what we know is that the annual customer is worth more mm -hmm. on average, even though they pay us half as much money. We take the average lifespan of a customer. What is the lifetime value? The lifespan of a customer times how much money they'd pay us, the lifetime, average lifetime value, LTV, right. another three-letter initialism. Conventional wisdom, industry standard, you want your CPA target to be one-third of the average lifetime value. So if I make 45 bucks lifetime of a customer, I wanna spend 15, conventional wisdom say. Sure. Or you could extrapolate that because our target would be $25, let's say, um, that the, the average lifetime value would be $75. Mm -hmm. Or um, if our, our target CPA is $50, you would extrapolate that our lifetime value must be 150. Mm -hmm. Well, then you look at how long does it take to get that hundred and fifty dollars. That's, That's also, also a fact because there's time value money, but there's also how quick does it come in, right. and hence how quick can you respend it, redeploy it right. for more marketing or more building or whatever. Right. So I might be able to recognize the revenue this year, but if I don't have the cash until the end of the year, monthly is on paper twice as much money, mm -hmm. but annual means I have the money in my pocket today, and I can turn around and I can spend it. Right. So if you say average. Uh, uh, the CPA target $25, and we pull in from an annual subscriber 30, I immediately have $5 in my pocket and then $25 to, to pay somebody to go get someone to sign up again. Yeah. So there's a cyclical nature to it and there's math. The point here is that 
for me, it's the number, uh, the, the lifetime value of a customer is mm. really important. And that's a thing that I can say generally, lifetime value is $75. I should spend $25 to acquire a new customer. Mm -hmm. If that is the math I've settled on, and you leave affordance for various things, and you've got room for overhead and whatever, but for a subscription service, one third, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say $25, easy math. I know, because you use a tracking link, nebula.tv slash Thomas Frank, yep. when somebody signs up, we see that that's you. So I can look at that and say, when somebody signs up using Tom's code, they stay twice as long, let's say. Your lifetime value, your average lifetime value, is twice as high. Should I still pay $25? Right, you should or, pay more. Or is it worth, well, I mean more, but is it worth paying twice as much if it's still, if it takes twice as long to get the return on the yeah, money? Probably not twice as much, because take, it takes so long to get right. the revenue to redeploy. Yeah. Right, but it does tell me if, your, if customers who come in through you are worth more money, even if you underperform a little bit, I can let that slide because mm -hmm. I understand that the delta between the total and your value is different. So the way I look at CPA targets and how well you're hitting them can be different between you and you know standard, median, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're I'm using hand waving numbers for math and. I couldn't tell you with a gun to my head what your numbers look like for mm -hmm. conversions. But my point is that like, as a sponsor, when you come back, or if I want to work with you again, the, the, the data, the targets that I care about might change a little bit based on other factors. So while you should be getting as much conversion data as you can from the sponsor, it's also important to understand how effective you are for that sponsor in other ways. If you can get mm -hmm. conversion data, good. If you can get retention data, even better. Knowing that that you can pull in a uh, thousand customers at a twenty five dollar target CPA, you could say, "Well, I'm worth twenty five thousand dollars." But that's a general target CPA. Right. If you know that your retention is twice as high, you can argue for more per acquisition. Mm -hmm. So, generally speaking, uh, a sponsor, uh, a, a marketing person at a given sponsor will have these targets. And there's a range. There's uh, all of the different creators they work with, and then they have the, the overall numbers they want to hit. So they're looking at a portfolio. And across all of this, they know that uh, the marketing department, maybe them or somebody else on their team or their boss, has set this is the goal, this is the budget. So they're not even necessarily looking very, very uh, specifically at you, like you, the creator as long as they're hitting their target and making their boss happy. Like, it's kind of good? Right, right. What you don't want to be is the creator who's so cheap that it offsets the expense of failure. Mm -hmm. What you want to be is the person who is clean down the middle. Okay. You are the best money they spend. You nail the numbers mm. right on the line. Think of it like tuning a guitar. You don't want to be sharp. You don't want to be flat. You want to be right on the note. Okay. If you can be that, then they're going to throw money at you every time because you're going to help normalize their numbers. I was going to ask you, like, for a sponsor like, um, say, Brilliant, are there other factors that would cause them to keep sponsoring, say, me at the same rate? Like, is it just Tom's LTV for his customers he brings us is higher or... Are there like reputational aspects mm -hmm. they look at? Are there like, you know, it, it, it's a good look for us to work with this creator. Yeah, so this yeah. spot didn't do so well. Let's, let's keep doing it. Yeah, not as much as we'd like to think. Okay. Uh, because there's so much data being associated with you good, mm -hmm. but how good? We tend to imagine as YouTubers that we are celebrities, that to this audience, we are famous because we look at. 300,000 views per video, and it's like 300,000 people love me. Right. Yeah, uh, maybe a few thousand people love you, and the rest just were kind of there. I assume most of them are like falling asleep. Right. And I just happened to come on the TV. <laughs> you were, <laughs> yeah, you were a pretty face and a thumbnail as they were scrolling by. Mm -hmm. You are not headlining Coachella. Calm down. Uh, maybe not this year. No. <laughs> yet. The... And that's not even a bad thing. It's just that we, we look in the sky and we see two circles of roughly the same size. We must assume that they are the same size. Right. 
but one is the moon and the other is the sun. And these things are very, very, very different. And when, um, I don't know, Ben Affleck is promoting a product versus when you're promoting a product, we could say that uh, Mr. Beast's uh, Squid Game video got more views than Netflix has subscribers. But if you were to go around asking people which they watch more, Mr. Beast or Netflix, like Mr. Beast videos are free to watch. Netflix, you have to pay. There's a difference there immediately. Right. The uh, uh, cultural awareness of this thing and the cultural awareness of this thing are very different. Okay. And it's easy for us to think as creators, as influencers, as YouTubers, that because I have this audience, this many people love me, this many people listen to me, and therefore you must pay me because I am a celebrity. I have the staggering star power where when I say thing, just the association is a positive look for you. It can be to that tiny fraction of audience who's actually your audience, right. but what is that really worth? Yeah. I'm reminded painfully of this every time I share music I like on Twitter. <laughs> Maybe like one like from someone who already listens to that band. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody else cares. Mm -hmm. The algorithm doesn't push it out. No, no one, you know, they don't care what I listen to. Yeah, they're like, shut up. Bro. Even though my yeah. music taste is amazing. Sure. Uh, but, you know, I talk about a new Notion feature and everything goes bananas mm -hmm. because my audience cares about me to a degree, but what they mostly care about is what they come to me for. Right. Like, what have I become representative of in their head? Yeah. What is the logical next step? Mm -hmm. if somebody sees your tweet. Why are they looking at your tweet? Are they in right. love with you and they want to know everything about Tom and you're a celebrity? Or do you just post a lot of like numbered list tweet threads with productivity tips and they want those productivity tips? Right. And then when you say something about music, they're like, I don't fucking care what you listen to. Give me more productivity tips. Yep. Not even in a grumpy or entitled way. That's just not what they're there for. Yeah. It's like uh, in the music world, like there's a band, they're not your favorite band, but you like a few of their songs you go to their show. Mm -hmm. When they start playing a song you don't know, you go get a drink. Yep. That's fine. It's part of the arrangement. Not everyone who comes to the show needs to know every word to every song. Right. Yeah, so the, the um, brand association thing, we're not celebrities. So much more dependent on the data. Much more. There, I mean, there, there's certainly, again, asterisks on all of this, there are certainly types of creators who are like, the top of a genre or the top mm -hmm. of a field or they're, uh, they're associated with a certain kind of thing. I think of like... Like uh, a Peter McKinnon with a cannon or something. Peter McKinnon with a, can, uh, a, a camera or uh, Marquez Brownlee with uh, uh, any tech product. Casey Neistat. Mm. Uh, there are creators who are so widely associated with a certain kind of quality. And I don't mean like production quality, but like uh, an aspect, a quality right. to themselves that, that goes beyond parasocial, it goes beyond aspirational, it's kind of its own thing. Mm -hmm. And for those types of creators, yeah, uh, there might be having this person's name uh, associated with you could be a good look. Mm -hmm. And you'll see sometimes brands will ask, brands, sponsors, will ask about, um, can we get a license to use the sponsor thing? In right. our, like, can we... Can we get that clip and we'll run it as ads elsewhere? I was about to ask, like, is that a, a good litmus test that you are that kind of creator, that the yeah. brand that wants to put you in ads? No. It's not? Okay. No. Like anything, there's good people and bad people. There's, I'd say more often there, there are good people who are doing bad things without realizing they're bad. Okay. Like, there's some industry practices that are very sharky that maybe it's not a person's fault, maybe it's a process problem, right? So let's assume positive intent for a second. Somebody sends you a contract. We're going to pay you $10,000 to sponsor your video. And you're like, awesome, let's go. Love the product. And they say, cool. Uh, we want it to be 60 second integration. We want it to be at the front of the video. And we want to be able to use, we want a clean cut of just the sponsored section because we're going to run that on our socials. You might go, no. You should say no to that. Why do they want it at the beginning of the video? That's weird. Logical next step put the sponsor at the end of the video because the logical next step after seeing an ad at the beginning of a video is to hit the skip button until the video starts, yep. not go buy product. Put it at the end where the logical next step is to hear what the person has to say. And if it's a good fit, the logical next step is to listen. And then if it's a good product and the person's interested, the logical next step is to go purchase. Right. You put it in the middle of the video, the logical next step is to skip. Put it at the beginning, logical next step, skip. 
I think that that's an artifact of sponsors thinking that eyeballs equals conversions, mm -hmm. views equals conversions, because they'll, they'll say things like, well, how much retention is there at the end of the video? Yes. It's like, well, obviously there's going to be less. Mm -hmm. But the number of people who would actually click and purchase is the same, if not higher. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to leave your video in the middle of your video to go buy a product. And if they do, that's then, also bad for right. you. Are they going to come back? <laughs> are they going to remember to finish the yeah. video? Honestly, probably not. This is kind of an aside, but I, I think of like the jobs to be done framework a lot. And like if you put a video out there, the job for the video to do is to have people watch it. Right. So if you immediately put an ad there and you're telling people, click off my video and go buy this thing, like you've sabotaged the job to be done of your entire video right, right away. Right. Like imagine you put on a concert and halfway through you tell the audience, I want you all to leave right now and go to 7-Eleven and buy a Snickers bar and then come back and I'll finish the show. Right. How many people come <laughs> back? Yep. How many people leave in the first place? Probably not that many people leave. And of, of the ones who do, very small percentage are coming back with the candy bar ready to rock. Yep. And that's, that's what we're talking about here. But when they say, and give us the clean cut, uh, give us, give it, let us post that, what they want is a free commercial. So break down for me like why that's a bad thing. It used to be that if I had a product or a service and I wanted to promote it, I would have to go and hire a production company and uh, a marketing team and the marketing people would put a campaign together a uh, proposal they'd put it in front of me I'd sign off on it they'd hire in the production company the production company hires in or brings in lighting people camera people motion graphics people editors uh, audio people they would do music clearance they'd hire actors they'd build sets the whole thing and we'd make a commercial and then I would take that commercial and I would go to TV networks and I would pay them money to show my commercial. So we're talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, just to produce the commercial. Mm -hmm. And then, depending on when and where and uh, whatever um, the TV commercial is shown, I have to pay every single time it's shown to anybody. And that can mm -hmm. be tens of thousands to millions of dollars to have my commercial shown. That's to show that commercial to an audience of a couple hundred thousand people, maybe a million, maybe a couple million if right. it's a popular show. Or now, I can go to an influencer and I can give you $10,000 and you'll do all of it for me. An excellent value for me. Mm -hmm. No wonder influencer marketing is so popular. It is so much cheaper. I can trick you into producing a free commercial and then giving me an extreme discount on airtime to reach the same number of people I would have reached on TV, except now I have the brand association of being integrated into the TV show that somebody was watching. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm getting product placement. I'm getting Don Draper turning to the camera and saying, by the way, sign up for Skillshare at the end of Mad Men. For 10 grand? Hell yeah, I'm gonna do that. No wonder it's effective, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so when they, when they say, I want, I want a clean cut or I want the, the rights to be able to run it on our social. What they're saying is, you're gonna produce a commercial for us for pennies and you're gonna run it as basically product placement on your show where you, the main character in your show, are going to look the audience in the eye and promote this. It's not a commercial anymore. That is a parasocial advertisement. Right. Not only that, I'm also gonna take your likeness in perpetuity and run it as a commercial on my own. Because you've produced this commercial for me for basically nothing, mm -hmm. I wanna milk it forever. Am I gonna pay you extra for that? Nah, no, probably not. So the first part of this, like, this is what we're talking about. Running a, a sponsorship. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Uh, so the, the likeness thing, is there is there like a right way to do it? Should you always say no? Should you say like, you get a year and it's an extra five grand? Like, how do you even negotiate that kind of thing? You definitely want a time limit on it okay? Uh, for a bunch of reasons. If we were to do this, let's say right now Squarespace came to us and they wanted you to do this. Okay. Let's say. We would want to make sure that there's a term limit on it, right? We don't want it to be that two years from now there's still ads with your face promoting Squarespace 
and Squarespace has stopped sponsoring you and that relationship went sour, but they're still using your likeness out there to promote them. Right. And you now don't get to work with Wix or Shopify because you've got this weird endorsement deal with, with Squarespace that you don't get paid for. So I've signed away my ability to work with any other creator right. or any other right. brand at the space. Yeah, yeah. Like your ability to ever work with a competitor, shot. Mm. That's what they're really tricking you into. They get a free commercial okay. that they can run whenever they want, and you never get to work with a competitor. Because mm -hmm. why would they want you to? So if we're going to do this, there's got to be a limit on it. So we could say a year, okay. and that seems like that's fair, right? Okay, you can do this for a year, you pay a little bit extra, done, right? Well, I guess I now have a year where I can't work with right. any of those brands, and right. if Squarespace doesn't want to sponsor me again, I've just given up. 12 months of income in that vertical. Yeah, so maybe what we should do, if, if this were to happen, then the move would be to, to put a, a, like a one-year limit on it and then have them guarantee bookings across that time. Gotcha. And so almost like a, an endorsement deal where it's like... Right, like we're in business. Let's Yeah, we're in business. Let's be in business. Let's right. not half-ass this shit. Like, let's actually do it. If this yep. is a partnership and you get to put my face up on your shit, then like... We're in business, like this is a real thing. Uh, what I worry about whenever I see creators saying like, oh yeah, I don't mind. It was a couple extra thousand dollars, like I needed the money. It's like, mm, we're poisoning the well for everybody here, aren't we? Right, we, because then it becomes an industry norm. Right, and YouTubers by and large are people who are younger and don't have extensive business experience mm -hmm. or contract negotiation experience. So what we end up with is people who think like, well, they showed me a list of other influencers they worked with, mm -hmm. and those people all worked with this brand, and they, they didn't complain, and they probably did similar deals. Sure. Or, I really want this deal. I think it's going to be great. The money's good. Just take it. Yes. And now they've normalized something. Now they've helped right. to set something as uh, they, they, they continue to set precedent, and they normalize bad behavior. And then the next creator comes along, and somebody like me says, you probably shouldn't do that. And they say, why not? All of these other creators do it. What's the problem? Mm -hmm. it's like, well, the problem is none of you should have done it. You're all getting paid less now because you sold yourselves out. Right. So there's something you just mentioned that I wanted to ask about for a long time. I have a theory on it. I have no proof. Maybe you do. You said a lot of influencers will go to a particular brand or a particular agency and they want to work with that agency or brand because another influencer has worked with them. Mm -hmm. So I have this theory. Um, as far as I know, Standard is one of the only agencies that actually gets conversion data for campaigns. Weirdly, yeah. Maybe the only one, and it actually goes and tells the creator, like, hey, you drove this many sales, and they were looking for this CPA, and that's why your rate is this. Um, you know, most other agencies don't do that. So I've had a theory for a long time that if you go to Agency X and they're advertising that, hey, we work with this big YouTuber over here, that YouTuber is almost like a magnet for other creators to come in. And so even if that YouTuber doesn't convert very well or perform very well for their brand deals, it kind of doesn't matter because the agency can sort of just like take from the smaller creators that get attracted to oh, come yeah. work with them. Yeah, we've seen this a ton. So back in the day, in the MCN era, the multi-channel network era, mm -hmm. where it was lots of predatory deals where basically as a creator, you would sign with an MCN and they would get you a better deal on AdSense. In exchange, they would take a percentage of your AdSense mm -hmm. revenue. So they, they might tell you your AdSense CPMs will double and we'll take 10%. And you might think, well, I'll take that deal, be part of the thing. Uh, and they would occasionally show up and offer you a sponsorship. Yep. And you're thinking, sometimes I even get brand deals and my AdSense rate is higher. All I have to give them is 10% of everything forever. What a wonderful value. Creators kind of figured out along the way that that's not really how that works and not a good deal. Mm -hmm. And the MCNs, uh, because they could just take 10% of all of the AdSense revenue, they would sign every channel they could find. I mean, it's like a horrible incentive because yeah. they're incentivized to go get more channels, not to help you. Right. They're and you. and the, they were dumping a lot of their revenue into the biggest creators mm -hmm. because they would attract smaller creators in. But even worse than that, you you had people abusing the system by like going out and creating a bunch of bullshit content farm channels, mm -hmm. straight up just ripping copyrighted content and reposting it. Uh, but because the the threshold to to get AdSense revenue was so low and the rules weren't super strict, you could 
start 100 channels reposting, literally just reposting other people's videos. Mm -hmm. And until you got caught, that AdSense money was flowing in. When you get caught, you just start a new one, start the whole cycle over again. And so you've got a bunch of these, these channels out there that are producing no value, but siphoning off AdSense money because ads were shown. YouTube got smart and creators got really exhausted. So from YouTube's perspective, they said this is a huge drain on the psychological benefits to advertisers. If advertisers know that we're putting this many ads on videos that aren't real videos or on uh, channels that aren't real channels and are going to be taken down, it's a bad look. And advertisers were, were not super happy. They created new thresholds for how, how long before you could uh, be eligible for the YouTube Partner Program. The other thing they did is they said if a channel gets a copyright strike, the MCN gets a copyright strike. Mm. So just existential threat to all the MCNs overnight. And yeah, and those channels, you know, if you're an MCN with 10,000 channels and you're, right. one of them is getting a copyright strike every 15 minutes, and suddenly like you've got a three strike, you're out policy, you're like, fuck. <laughs> you're, you're done in 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, like what are you gonna do? So suddenly the MCN shut all of those channels down, the mm-hmm. money stopped flowing in, the MCNs dry up to one extent or another. That's why they're not really a thing anymore. They Uh, never really added value. They were just a big um, parasite. So that's the reason for the 4,000 watch time hour rule then too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to have a real channel that is watched by people Mm -hmm. over a period of time and and enough subscribers to indicate that there might actually be something here. Right. Not a perfect system. I've got plenty of frustrations with it. I mm-hmm. think especially for musicians who don't do high frequency content, but they're making yeah. art or filmmakers and musicians, people who make low frequency, high quality art. Mm-hmm. It really sucks that YouTube can put ads on my movie or on my uh, music videos and th- they can put ads on those things and collect that revenue. Mm-hmm. And I will, by definition, never see a penny of it. That's right. a bummer. But uh, generally speaking, it's good because it, it means that there are fewer of those just content farm bullshit setups. So when we moved away from that, it created a a psychological dynamic where creators felt like the problem with MCNs was lock-in. You had to sign these contracts, you were locked in. So when agencies showed up, they all did the same thing. They would say, we're gonna bring you a deal. Would you like to work with Audible? Would you like to work with Squarespace? Would you like to work with Skillshare? We'll set that up for you. No contract needed. Mm -hmm. We'll, We'll do this one deal and you know we'll, we'll just bring you stuff sometimes. You don't owe us anything beyond the commission on this deal. And creators thought, what a breath of fresh air, no more lock-in. I know where this is going though because this was my first brand deal. Right, right. <laughs> uh, so where this goes is now you've got agencies out there who uh, will show up and offer you an Audible deal. And somebody might come in and say, hey Tom, Audible wants to work with you. Would you like to work with Audible for $3,000? And you might think, I'd love to build a relationship with Audible. That sounds great. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Then they go to Audible. who they, they have Audible's phone number or email address. They go to Audible and they say, we got this guy, Thomas Frank. He's awesome. Only $10,000 for the video. So Audible doesn't even know. They have no idea. They come to me first. Yeah. And for various reasons and all kinds of weird behind the scenes stuff. Audible for a long time, God, what am I allowed to say? There were people who were in charge of campaigns for certain sponsors who were buddies with people who worked for sponsor booking agencies, Mm. like old buddies. Mm -hmm. And so what they would do is they'd say, yeah, we have to fill our quota for these sponsors. Like keep bringing us stuff. We'll leave it to you, go find the creators, bring them to us. Mm -hmm. And so agency would say, great. And they would flood YouTuber inboxes with, would you you like to work with Sponsor? Would you like to work with Audible for $1,000? Would you like to work with Squarespace for $1,000? They'd make up numbers, send them out. Any return email, any responses, well that's, you've just generated a lead. Mm -hmm. And you now take, you now have a product on the hook that you can take back to the agency representing these sponsors and sell it to them. And they're like, yeah, sure, let's test all of these things and we'll see what works, what doesn't. When you look at it as a portfolio play, 
Some will be winners, some will be losers. The ones that, that performed well get rebooked. The ones that don't perform well don't get rebooked. The problem is that the creator, you, have no idea what the sponsor has been charged. You only know what you're getting paid. So you don't know what their cut is, right. but more importantly, you don't know what they were expecting you to perform at. Right, right. So you, you come in and say uh, yes to 3,000, and then the audible or whatever spot runs, and they see the performance, and they're like, now we paid 10 grand for that, it was only worth seven. Like mm -hmm. We're not rebooking that, no thank you. You never get another call. Even though you were more than double the value of what you were paid, right? because somebody in the middle charged so much extra that you weren't worth, mm -hmm. and had no responsibility to that relationship, you're now gonna get nothing. You have no relationship with the sponsor. The reason the data is so important, the reason the trans uh, transparency is so important, is because if you had known that you were worth seven, and if these people in the middle, this agency, had a fiduciary responsibility to you to, to build and maintain this relationship as best they can, then you would know what their commission was. Mm -hmm. You would know what you were worth. And then when performance came back in, and they said it wasn't worth 10, it would be worth seven. These guys come back to you and say it would have been worth seven, you would know that you're worth seven. Mm -hmm. And then the next sponsor you talk to and the next sponsor you talk to, you can take that data and say, well, I'm worth this. There's no more guessing or trying to estimate mm -hmm. or reading the tea leaves to figure out what you should charge the sponsor. You would know. You would have a data point of proof you were worth this much to this sponsor on this date. Mm -hmm. The middleman here has all of the information and has no obligation to you. And really no obligation to the sponsor, except they want to keep bringing good stuff to the sponsor, they're not gonna bring you back, you failed. So they'll just churn through more right. creators. Right. Or they'll There's come back and, and offer you an absurdly low rate later where they're mm -hmm. taking 50, 60% commission. They don't represent you, they don't technically represent the sponsor. Who do they represent? Themselves, I guess. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no joke. So explain to me how lock-in is bad. Explain right. to me how a contract is bad, because what you'd get out of a contract with these guys is definition of their roles and responsibilities, mm -hmm. and you'd get transparency. And if you don't get transparency in the contract, don't sign the contract. It was also worse than that for me. So when, when this agency will, will remain unnamed, I guess for me not getting in trouble. We should definitely not say it out loud. <laughs> um, when they came to me, they were like, hey, Audible wants to work with you. I think it was actually three grand or maybe two. Uh, but the contract, you know, there's no agency lock-in. But the contract says for six months after this spot runs, you can't work with Audible through anyone else. So I'm not locked into the agency, but I can't go work with Audible any other way. Right. And if they don't come back to me, which they didn't, I just don't get to work with Audible. And I remember this. This was 2017, VidCon, I met you. Uh, I think I, it was like two months after I had done my Audible spot. You couldn't book Audible for me for four months. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's also probably prudent to say that like our commission is 20% mm -hmm. across the board. It doesn't fluctuate for any creator. It's just literally 20%. Yeah, and I think that's pretty every, common. Every single creator signs the exact same contract. Mm -hmm. It's a really important thing for us. Yeah, 20% is industry standard mm -hmm. because of the type of thing that we do for a 360 talent agent, like in the entertainment industry, 10% is normal, but they're getting 10% mm -hmm. of everything you do. And I am starting to see YouTube managers who take 10% of everything, and I'm like, so that's, that includes Patreon, what are you doing? Yeah, so like, let's break down what are the pitfalls there. If you get somebody who's just like, hey, I wanna be your manager, I get 10%. Actually, a, a YouTube, it was about a year ago, a YouTuber came to me, uh, not a good fit for us, mm -hmm. and I think both sides, we knew that, but you know, friendly. Came to me and said, I'm thinking about signing uh, th this manager who would be pretty dedicated to me and it's gonna be really great. It's a one person shop so I'd have his full attention. It'd be a 10% of everything. And I said, do not do it. And he's like, why not? I said, well, what, what is this person going to do beyond the sponsor work? Like what, 10% of what? Like how far does that extend? And he said, it's 10% of sponsor bookings. So great deal there. 10% mm -hmm. of AdSense, mm, go on. How are they earning that? 10% uh, um, of Patreon, 
all right, 10% of potential equity deals. And I'm like, Ooh. what does that mean? And I pulled that thread, and the example I was given was, like if I did one of these things like Spotter or Jelly Smack, where they give me money to buy the AdSense value over the next this period of time, uh, then, then he would get 10% of what they pay me. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you should never do one of those deals. Yeah. Never. You, there's, there's no situation in which the today money is going to be worth more than the accumulation of the AdSense. If it's a payday loan for the creator economy, you should absolutely not do it. And now you've created a, a dynamic where this manager will absolutely tell you you should. Yeah, because he's incentivized. Right. He's going to get more money now. Mm-hmm. He doesn't, like, oh, he cares about your future. For sure. But also, yep. why not get some money now? I mean, who knows if you're even gonna still be a YouTuber in five years. Let's, mm-hmm. you know, let's stack the deck here and make sure. He should be, this manager should be the angel on your shoulder in this situation. Yep. And you're now creating a scenario where he is only incentivized to be the devil on your shoulder. Kind of a similar situation. Some friends of mine recently got pitched by a copywriter who said, I don't have rates. Uh, just pay me a percentage of the additional sales I generate. And so he writes this copy, and they're like, it's it's awful, but it's like very much built to just juice sales as hard as possible right now at the expense of trashing the uh, relationship with the audience. Mm. So it's, it's a twisted incentive there. Because right. if you agree to that, you're basically incentivizing them to get as much money of you as, out of you right now because they're not signing on to become a partner long term. They're right. just, you know, I get a percentage of whatever I generate for you over the life of this campaign. So let me <laughs> trash the relationship with your audience now in order to maximize my profit yeah. and then leave. Uh, and this is a YouTuber? Yeah. Uh, the other problem with that is, let's say the video goes massively viral. Oh, this wasn't for a video. This was what like, this oh, it was a copywriter for a landing page for a product they were selling. Okay, well, let's say that they do some other promotion and again, like maybe they do a sponsorship or something. There's, the point is, there's a lot of things that could lead to that page suddenly getting a big burst that has nothing to do with the copy. And now you're you're disincentivizing yourself away from changing anything else. Mm -hmm. Because if you change anything else and there's a big spike, well, now you're paying this person for money that they didn't help you earn. Uh, like which, uh, nothing about that makes any sense. Yeah, so a big rule for me, uh, both working with managers in terms of YouTube sponsorships, but anything is I want to work with people who have to work to earn what they're earning. Mm-hmm. So no cuts of AdSense, no cuts of whatever. Uh, but additionally, who are invested in my long-term success and want to make it a partnership. There's a video that I point to all the time, link in the description probably, uh, Steve Jobs talking about consultants. Mm-hmm. And it basically comes down to the problem with consultants is the lack of scar tissue. Mm -hmm. Unless you've really been in it and had ownership of this thing, what you have is a a thin, perhaps colorful, two-dimensional veneer of what the reality uh, and the pain of building something looks like. Mm -hmm. When you can say, as a strategy consultant or or whatever, that, look, my clients have, have gone on to do these big, big, big things, like, cool. Show me the list of your clients, everyone you've ever worked with. Does this group represent 100% of your client list or 1% of your client list? Mm -hmm. How long did you work with these people? Was it over a period of years or did you come in and consult for a week and they were going to succeed with or without you? There's just no way to know in a I work with these people or these people have written a nice pull quote for my website because we're friendly. That doesn't tell me anything. I am naturally skeptical on the verge of distrustful of, of consultants, especially in this business, because it is really easy to sell a younger and less business experienced crowd of people who really want to succeed in a fame-driven, influence-driven industry. It can be very easy to sell them the idea that Mr. Beast did this, if you just do this, you'll get here. Right. And look at all of these success stories. 
everywhere you go on YouTube. You can't throw a rock without hitting a YouTube success story. Therefore, it must actually be easy if only you knew the right guy. And when somebody like, God bless him, Jimmy, Mr. Beast will, will talk. He'll take a call from every one of these consultants and like pick their brain, right? Like he wants to learn everything he can from everybody. Nom, nom, nom. He likes to eat up all the information. Yep. Uh, that's kind of what makes him cool is that he's over, over the years collected uh, uh, like a menagerie of friends who are uh, experienced and who have done a bunch of things. And he'll, he'll, you know, he'll, he'll have a conversation with just about anybody. But then when every one of these consultants will now say that I've worked with Mr. Beast, yeah. Is he now validating? Mm -hmm. Are people now going to think that his success was somehow because of them? We've seen people publicly take credit for Jimmy's success. Yep. When we can tell on the face of it that that's bullshit. So the number of people who will uh, come in without any real responsibility to you, the, the sharks who don't owe you anything, there's no contract, they, they will make their money whether you make more or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, the incentive for them is to get in, extract as much value as possible without burning the relationship, get out, and put you uh, on a list on their website saying, I worked with you. That's, that's their incentive. Do you think that's the only incentive? No, but if you are, uh, if you're out there looking for people to work with and, and who, who are you paying to manage your relationships and help manage your money, mm -hmm. How, how comfortable would you feel trusting yeah. that to somebody whose primary incentive is themselves and to juice the cash today? Right. There's lots of today money out there. You can sell the future of your channel for a, a check today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely you can, more than ever. There's plenty of payday loan companies that will take the future of your AdSense, which could be worth millions, and give you a $20,000 check mm -hmm. and make you think that it's a good deal. And there are plenty of big name influencers who have done deals with those companies that they'll point to and say, look, he did it. But you have to think about what are the incentives? Does this person work for me or do they work for themselves? Right. You made a good point earlier about when there's a consultant bragging about their client list. You don't know if it's 100% of their client list or, or 1%. Uh, it reminded me of a story that's a good illustration, I think. Very old timey scam. I think it goes back to the 1800s. Uh, and a guy would take out a thing in a newspaper, uh, or he'd, he'd send letters. This is what it was. Uh, he'd send letters to you know a thousand people over here saying, "Hey, this stock's going to go down," and then send letters to another thousand people and say, "Hey, this stock's going up." Uh, well, then whichever one is right, you now have a pool of a thousand people who are like, "Oh, he got one prediction right," and you just keep doing that. So 500, 500, you make another prediction. 250, 250, make another prediction until eventually you have a group of say 50 people who are like, dang, this guy got the last 10 stock predictions right. He's and a now genius. you should listen to him. Now you send him a, you know, yeah, now you send him another mailer saying, hey, invest with me and I'll grow your fortune. Yeah. And you know, all you did was just flip a coin 10 times, but you you told this group of 50 people the right answer mm -hmm. each 10 times. And, and they didn't know that you were mailing a hundred times more people than that. There's numbers games you can play. Mm -hmm. There's obfuscation of reality that you can do. And there's um, cold reading, like being able to right. go in, talk to somebody about where their channel is. And if you can see based on things that this person is saying, that their trajectory is probably definitely up. Mm -hmm. uh, like, oh yeah, we should work together. Here's some things that you should do. And then when those things work, because anything would work, you were gonna blow up regardless. Uh, they look like a genius. So I guess we should be fair and say like, these are the incentives that exist in this area. Sure. Not necessarily that everyone operating in this area is trying to just burn through relationships. No. Like I, I think don't... there are people who genuinely do care, but you do have a point that the incentives can easily get twisted. Yeah, I don't, I, I wouldn't even, uh, despite my skepticism, and, and uh, you and I have debated this a ton, I would not say that my default position is that these are bad people who are looking to scam you. I would say that by and large, these are probably good people who think they're giving good advice mm -hmm. and they're implementing toxic business practices as a way to grow their stable of creators and advertise themselves. There are people mm -hmm. like you who you really like the, the Twitter format of listicle full of advice. That's a thing you enjoy doing mm -hmm. and you're pretty good at it but you're giving away advice. Like you're just sharing tips and sharing thoughts. You're not really selling anything. Not really. 
somebody could funnel down to find your Notion tutorials or like it sets you up as a subject matter expert or whatever. But there's nothing inherently toxic about it. Mm. When somebody goes out and there's like 10 secrets to uh, booking uh, higher sponsor rates and I'll read through them like this is all either dead obvious, completely wrong, fabricated intentionally or uh, fabricated intentionally to fit some bigger narrative that pushes people to the next phase of the funnel. Mm. People want to establish themselves as subject matter experts because it leads to here. And I don't think it's because they're evil. I think that they believe everything they wrote here in their book or in their course. They believe everything that they're going to teach you in their, uh, their coaching. They believe that stuff. But then the things they do to get you there, in their mind, the ends will always be justified. Mm. The ends will always justify the means. Uh, so when they're out there tweeting and it's like everything's a funnel, everything's a funnel, but at no point along the way is there any real value. But there will be a couple of people somewhere in there who say, oh no, I talked to this guy and he made a good point about this. It's like, well, cool, he made a good point. Mm. Or he's really nice. I spent a ton of time talking to him. Good guy. But is this right? Is this the best way to do this? And what I worry about is if we're getting all of our information in the sort of infant stage salad days of the creator economy, if it's all tribal knowledge, if everything we have uh, we've learned from consultants or coaches um, who may or may not have ever worked with a successful creator, what are we filling our heads with? What is the tribal knowledge? I've talked to creators who just amongst themselves were sharing like their accumulated knowledge and they would send me spreadsheets of like here's, here's what we've seen in my community for what sponsor rate should be. And it was stuff like, oh yeah, a sponsor should always pay a $30 CPM. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Right. You think every view is equal in value? That's insane. That's mm -hmm. not a real thing. That's never been a real thing. Why would you think that? And it's because six or seven people who had an experience and they triangulated in on what they thought were the centerpieces of an experience, right. and they treated that as fact. Yep. Writ large, you get creators. Again, by and large, younger people who don't have a ton of business experience who are very earnestly trying to find their way through an industry that only barely exists. Yep. And there's not a ton of great resources yet. And there are many, many sharks in the water. And there are many well-intentioned people who will use sharky business practices to sell what they think is a good product People falling into the sharky business practice trap only confirms for them that what they're doing is correct. Mm -hmm. We don't have a system, we don't, we don't have regulation, we don't have a system of, of governance or uh, fact checking. There's no central bodies that, that can help understand these things. And maybe there shouldn't be. But there's also not as much as I'd like critical thinking about what are the dynamics of this relationship. That's why I want to make this. Like, I don't have anything to sell around booking sponsorships. And I, I you know. Let's, let's call it a bias. Let's call we'll, it a bias. We'll call it a bias. You're, you're, uh, to an extent, you're selling me or selling the organization. I am. And I was going to get to that. Okay. Like, I personally don't have a uh, course or I don't do coaching or none of that. I have no desire. I want to make Notion tutorials and program all day. Uh, I've just done this a lot. Uh, my bias is that I'm a part owner in Standard mm -hmm. and you run Standard. However, I do not feel that that is a compromising bias because I get the feeling the majority of the people watching this, like you're not trying to get them as clients right now. No. In fact, I'm probably going to fill your inbox with a bunch of hopefuls that is, is gonna, <laughs> you're going to have to go through. Yeah. And I'm sorry for that in advance. Um, but I wanted to put something out there that was like good information from someone who was doing it day in and day out for a, a roster of clients that you exclusively represent so you're kind of on the line for mm -hmm. making sure that they are taken care of long term. I wanted that to exist in the world. Yeah, and I'll, I'll defend my position here uh, against the straw man that we're, we're inventing mm -hmm. as, as being skeptical of us. The, the, the contract that our creators sign, including you and me, you and I have both signed the exact same contract as everyone else yep. who is a part of this organization. Um, I'm a creator, you are a creator, this is a, an organization of creators, uh, for creators, by creators, et cetera, uh, flowery language. 100% um, of the ownership of Standard is creators. Mm -hmm. We really did build this. Um, every one of the owners had to sign the same damn contract. Yep. And 
All of the contracts are the same and all the contracts are good. And all of the contracts are on a 30-day rolling basis. So now I and my team of uh, 94 people uh, have a perpetual incentive to do the best we can at all times. Yep. We need to. We are on the hook to be constantly providing and demonstrating our value. Because if not, if we don't, you can leave. Mm -hmm. This is an exclusive relationship. And if at any point in this exclusive relationship you're not satisfied, you can come talk to us about it, you can complain, we can work stuff out, or you can go. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people will go for any number of reasons, not very often. And when that happens, it's like, what can we learn from that? Was it a bad relationship fit? Did, could we have done something better? And that's just part of life. Yep. If you're never in a relationship, it's hard to build. Right. And if the beginning of every relationship is a marriage, it's hard to get to the point where you're willing to do that, and so you end up not having relationships. Um, so this notion of a sponsor booking agency with no real responsibility to you, I mean, no strings attached sounds nice, right? Until Except they something. have, yeah, they have no incentive to help you beyond right. getting their commission on the last deal. Yeah, and now there's traditional uh, talent agencies who will do uh, influencer marketing, sponsor booking stuff for certain types of talent. Uh, and those will be like 360 deals that you sign and you're just with that agency and they'll occasionally bring you sponsorships. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, even if you get your own, you still owe them a commission, which is, but you know, it's worth it because you're signed with that agency. And they'll get you all kinds of stuff. They'll get you, uh, The Rock will be a guest in your video. But it's I've actually be. heard, I've actually heard somebody, uh, they were told that, that if they signed with this agency, The Rock would appear in their video. They said it, it would happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm guessing that didn't happen. It did not happen. No. I had a friend, and again, there's, like, there's so many names I want to name, but I don't think I can. Mm -hmm. I had a friend who was approached, I think, by an MCN, but this was like in 2020 or something. And they were super excited because this MCN is owned by a giant media brand, like very well known mm -hmm. media brand. So he's like, wow, you know, I. I'm super in love with a lot of the things they've made and all this kind of stuff. Like, I kind of want to join. Tom, can you look over the contract for me? And so I look over the contract and I see that the, the MCN is saying, like, we can help you get brand deals. We can help you uh, collaborate and, and do collabs with the other people who are signed with us. We can do channel reviews. We will give you a free subscription to Epidemic Sound. <laughs> which costs $15 per month or, or something like that. Yeah. Notice I'm saying can for most of these things, so there's no obligation for them to do any of this. And then on the creator side, the MCN would literally own any content that they posted during the, peer, uh, during the term. Own it. So you lose all the rights to your content. It's on your channel. There was also language like we, we can put our logo on your channel's header or in your thumbnails if we want to. So I'm like, you want to sign a contract where they're going to own your content. They're going to get a cut of your AdSense guaranteed every month. They get to plaster their logo over your channel if they want to, and they owe you nothing other than a free music account, which costs less than they will take from your AdSense every month. But they did save him $15. <laughs> I guess they saved him $15 on his Epidemic Sound account, which is owning the not content. even as good as a car insurance. Owning the content, that is absurd. Yeah, that, it was the first time I've seen that one. We don't even own the content for Nebula Originals. Mm -mm. Like, the, the last thing I would ever want to do is anything where I own creator content. Right. That's like the most toxic and damning thing I can imagine doing. Mm -hmm. If there's any one thing... Like, I think next in line would be screwing up creator money, like not getting somebody paid right. would be really bad. Taking ownership of things they made without giving them money for it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, not paid work. Just like, oh, I get to be associated with this brand. <laughs> in exchange for association. <laughs> it's not even exposure. It's just, I, I can say I'm with them. It's like, it's like a mob thing almost. I'd like to break down, like, what are some of the criteria that people should keep in mind when considering uh, whether to sign with an agency or work with an agency, you know, could be exclusive, could be non-exclusive, like, what should people be looking for? Transparency. 
look for scar tissue, look for accountability, look for uh, the relationships that they have. Although that can be tricky. There's, there's certainly agencies out there that are like clustered up groups of YouTuber friends mm -hmm. where everyone is just kind of like in the click and then they'll bring others in and the idea is like if you sign this deal you get to be part of the click mm. and that can be attractive but like what what are you trading and what are their obligations uh, i would say look at what they're on the hook for mm -hmm. whatever the agency what are they promising you not vaguely not hand wavy we might what are they actually on the hook for mm -hmm. we are on the hook we have an obligation to make a best effort to put a sponsor on any video you say you want to sponsor on. We have an obligation to get you the fairest rate possible. And the way we, we account for that is we negotiate for data. We get as much conversion data as we can from every sponsor we work with so that we can say, here are the numbers, here's what you're worth. If you want us to go in and ask for more, we can. We don't have a good argument for it, but we mm -hmm. can. We can go do that. We have an obligation to help build and then maintain those relationships. So if, if things are going south, if things sour, we have to be accountable for that. And sometimes they, they, that's unavoidable, but we're always on the creator's side. If things are tricky, we go to the creator and it's, what do you want us to do here? Here's how we think we should navigate this. What do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. Is there, is there somebody, are you signing a contract with somebody you can trust to maintain those relationships because they are accountable for the relationships? Are you signing a contract with somebody who is going to be transparent with you about those relationships? For example, and this isn't a sales pitch, but like the kind of thing that should be done, uh, we get through the, the contracty bits with any sponsor and the creator, and communication at that point is still between the creator and the sponsor. We don't get paid because we know an email address that you don't. Right. If the only thing we have is a secret list and we don't want you to know who the marketing person is, we're not adding value. Yep. If you're ever thinking to yourself, I could just cut these people out of the email chain and save the commission, somebody's probably not doing a spectacular job. That's a conversation you should have. Similarly, when you look at the, the contractual obligations and responsibilities, who signs the deal with the sponsor? What do you mean? Like the creator signing the deal versus you signing the deal? Right. So we, we had a conversation with uh, somebody from an agency on Clubhouse a couple years back during that two-week period when people use Clubhouse. <laughs> and uh, they were, it was a few of us and then somebody from this other agency and then somebody from a sponsor. And they were talking about how they and the sponsor had such a great relationship. And uh, it says, there's something in the, in the phrasing around like, uh, we've we've brought them lots of creators or something or we've something that sort of like hinted that they were working for the sponsor and so I teased that out I'm like wait who do you have an obligation to in that relationship like is the deal with the creator exclusive do you have a fiduciary obligation and the answer was well no no it's non exclusive like they can still get brand deals elsewhere too we just mm -hmm. like help manage these relationships I was like okay but like what happens if something goes wrong in that relationship Oh, we make sure that it doesn't. Right, right, right. But if it does, is your obligation to back the creator and support them or is it to back the brand and support them? And he said, well, we'd like to think that we make both sides happy. And it's like, if somebody's getting sued, I said, okay, who signs the contract? Does the creator sign a contract with you and then you sign a contract with the sponsor? They said, oh, no, no, no. The creator signs the contract with the sponsor. And I said, do you, do you review it for them? and like walk them through what it all means. And they said, no, the creator would be responsible for bringing their own legal counsel and doing contract review. And it's like, and if anything breaks down in that, well, it'd be between the creator and the sponsor. Huh. So what would you say? So what exactly, <laughs> yeah. What, what exactly is the value you're bringing to that relationship? What is, like, who do you work for? Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound like you work for the creator and, does, and you say you don't work for the sponsor. So who, like, to whom do you have a legal responsibility? The mm -hmm. line goes dead for what felt like an hour, which I thought was funny. But the, the reality is that in that case, there is no responsibility. They signed nothing. Right. They match made and then took money. 
they introduced two people to one another and then got a commission for it. Mm-hmm. Nice work if you can get So it. they're tender, I guess. <laughs> right? Right? So in, in this scenario, the, the, the pain point, the problem I'm pointing out here, is that the creator still has to go through the contract themselves. They mm-hmm. still have to do legal review. They still have to understand all of this stuff. And I can't stress this enough, creator economy, the creators, largely a group of younger people who don't have a lot of business experience, don't have a lot of contract review experience. And so you suddenly, every brand who comes along is putting a contract in front of you. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, I want the deals, I want the deals, and you sign things. Bad precedent. It's hard to know what you're signing up for every time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they sneak stuff in. Not because they're evil, necessarily, they might be. but it might be that like just legal put that in because it's boilerplate for a different kind of contract and they just reused it over here. Yep. I and mean, I had a contract with a brand, not for a sponsorship or something else, where it was like, we get a license to any content you've ever made to use however we want. And I'm like, not only is that a bad thing for me, but like I literally can't sign it mm-hmm. because there are other parties who I would violate their agreements if yep. I were to sign this. Yep. There's um, uh, stock footage companies that you had to get licenses from, Mm -hmm. music companies you had to get licenses from. Of course you wouldn't be able to do that. That's insane. So if if you're going to work with somebody whose job it is to bring you sponsors as your agency and they're still going to have you sign the the contract with the, the sponsor, what is it you'd say you do here? Right. What is your role as an agency if you're not that buffer? So I want a Tinder I can complain to when my date breaks up with me. Uh, (laughs) And they'll go do something about it. Uh, What (laughs) what you want is a shield. You want want somebody who is managing the relationship, Mm -hmm. who has skin in the game. For any of our creators, they never sign a deal with the sponsor. We do. Every, Every insertion order is between us and the sponsor. And then we have contracts between us and the creator where the creator's on the hook for certain things. Like Mm -hmm. it's stipulated in the cut. Like we expect that you'll uh, hand in um, like the the sponsor reads for review uh, two business days before publishing so that the sponsor has a chance to do that. And then we tell the sponsors, you have two business days to review this. And if you don't, then we just publish. Yep. Well, they have expectations of us. We have expectations of you. You have expectations of us. We have expectations of them. The money flows this way. And if there's anything that breaks down, we are there to make sure that you still get paid. Mm -hmm. We are there to make sure that things get smoothed out because if we don't, then suddenly we don't get paid anymore. Or if you run into a problem, they can't sue you because how bad would it be for us if a bunch of sponsors we work with start sponsoring a bunch of creators we work with? Well, I mean, we'd have to pick a side and the side that we would legally be obligated to pick is the creator. In a world where- Can you start suing creators we're working with? Yeah, like if a sponsor were to say, you deleted the video because of whatever, mm. now we're mad. Right. I can say there's no provision guaranteeing that the video will be up forever. Mm-hmm. There's a relationship issue there. We're going to have to talk through this, but you, you don't get to sue anybody for it. I can say that if I'm in the contract chain. Yep. If the contract is directly between the sponsor and the creator, and the sponsor is grumpy, and the creator signed a thing they shouldn't have signed, and nobody told them not to, and the creator says, well, I absolutely will not do that. And a lawsuit ensues. There's nothing you really can do or have to do. We just go, good luck, guys. Yeah. And, but you still got your commission. Yep. <laughs> so, like, who did we serve in this relationship? Right. What relationship did we manage? Mm-hmm. What value did we provide other than, like, hey, you guys should meet. Give me money. So I think we can, we can add a very uh, hard item to the list there. Uh, an agency you work with should represent you. Yes. Which means ideally there's a contract you sign with the agency. That way the agency can be the one signing the contracts with the brands for you. Mm. And then they go to bat for you if yeah. something goes wrong. And, and look, there's, there's plenty of, of types of agency relationships where if an actor is doing a deal with a movie studio, they don't sign a movie contract with their agent and the agent does with the studio. But that's not what this is. Mm-hmm. We have the resources, we have a legal team, our contracts have all been reviewed, and we have the size and gravity and leverage to push back. Mm -hmm. We should do that. Collective action is a good thing. Going in and negotiating your own deal, signing your own contract, 
you're getting the thing they were willing to hand you. Right. Or you're getting the thing you were able to negotiate. Isn't the point of somebody in the middle that they do that? Mm -hmm. Isn't the point of having an agency, a management agency in this case for sponsor bookings, isn't the whole point that they sort that stuff out Mm -hmm. and that what you're paying for is the leverage and scale that they bring to the table to get you a better deal or to get you better data or to ensure longevity in the relationship, which is how you get sustainability? I, I just don't understand why this isn't the default. And I, I say all of this, but the truth is that that's actually really hard to find. Most agencies don't work that way, mm-hmm. in my experience. The other thing I would say is if you're going to work with an agency, you should work with an agency that actually represents you and on paper, in the contract, has an obligation to serve you first and mm-hmm. foremost versus the other party in a contract. That's also very rare. Most sponsor booking companies don't sign the creators to a contract, right. which is weird. It's like what we were talking about a minute ago. Uh, it's, it's like you're going in to get a divorce and you and your soon-to-be ex-wife both have the same lawyer mm-hmm. and they don't actually owe either of you anything, but you're both going to pay? Yeah. What? Or it's like um, you know getting a real estate agent and you find out like the same agent is the seller's agent. Right, right, which makes no can sense. happen and they have to do a thing and whatever. Uh, but you, you wouldn't want that. No, no you, you certainly shouldn't. <laughs> like, why would you want your agent to be someone who is also ostensibly supposed to be trying to get the best deal for the seller? Right. So we're going to get a divorce, and we're going to use the same lawyer, and that lawyer, don't worry, will, the way they're going to get paid is a percentage of alimony. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> right? <laughs> that sounds like a bad deal. <laughs> it's hard to find. There's only... Uh, in my travels, there's only a few agencies who, who even operate remotely like this, and I, mm-hmm. I wish that that weren't the case. But unless and until we see more savvy creators pushing agencies for these things, we're not going to get them. We're yep. going to get go and sign with agency for brand deals, and then if that eventually doesn't work out, people leave and they just go to the next agency and they just cycle through, right. which is just a layer of abstraction above the current problem of hopping from sponsor to sponsor. Yep. So, I don't know, kids, go and demand better from your agency. Anyone you talk to, tell them that you will only work with them if they do X, Y, and Z. That's kind of what I'm hoping for here is like to put out a list of essentially demands. Yeah. So more and more creators start asking for exclusive representation, ideally with a clause that lets you leave in a reasonable period of time if you don't like the relationship. Yeah. You know, like we have 30 days. And puts the agency on the hook for specific things that matter to you yep. and where the agency is focused on getting you not just as many dollars today as possible, but as much information today as possible. Because mm-hmm. that information will lead to dollars. When you understand right. what the KPIs are, when you understand what the target metrics for the sponsor are and how well you're doing, then the dollars, that's just math. That's mm-hmm. easy. So let's get into that for a second. And and I want to wrap back around to it a little later because I do want to talk about people who want to, at least right now, book their own deals. There's going to be a lot of people out there who are like either either don't want an agency or agencies don't want to work with me yet and I want to go pitch my own sponsorships, like yada, yada, yada. There's going to be people like that. Uh, So I, I do want to wrap around to this question for that crowd eventually. But from the agency point of view... How do you go about getting conversion data from a brand? Because the brand obviously knows what their KPIs are. Mm -hmm. But when you, the agency, go, hey, we want to know what your CPA is so we can set a fair rate, how do you you incentivize them to actually give you the correct rate? Say no. So you just say, I'm not going to work with you if you don't share data. And, And then how do you ensure you're getting the actual CPA? Uh, work with more than one sponsor. Okay, so it's really like a, an averaging thing. Yeah, like you can see if five out of six sponsors are giving you data that seems pretty consistent and one is like, oh, you're way underperforming. Unless that, I mean, maybe that one sponsor genuinely that's not performing as well, bad audience fit or something, but chances are they're... Uh, but like the truth is that if they're willing to share data, they're going to share the real data. Okay. They're, I've, I haven't, I've never, we've never caught a sponsor lying. In that way, not once. Getting them to share the data, tricky. And the only way we've ever gotten a sponsor to share the data is by saying, we will work with you if you share the data. So it's just a contingency, or not contingency, it's it's contingent upon. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, when we now, when we go into any new sponsor meeting, we let them know this is an open data relationship. We'll give you demographics data, we'll give you retention data, anything you want to know about a video that you sponsor, we're going to share that data with you. Let us know, we'll share all the numbers. You're going to share the conversion data. We need to know what your targets are, we need to know where each creator landed. And because we, it works as a portfolio, the, the bigger we get, the easier it is to get them to say yes for a couple of reasons. One, it's, it saves them work because it's basically what they're doing. We're doing a portion of their job for them mm -hmm. in managing these things. Um, it helps to balance out the, the rates across the portfolio, which is good for them. Uh, but also, when, when you have a large enough collection of data uh, and the, the data sort of normalizes, you can see from month to month what the ups are, what the downs are. You'll see that, yeah, this one was a little bit lower and we can see on our end the metrics for that particular video were lower than normal. Mm -hmm. When these things match up, I mean, it's, it's not... It's not an exact science. Like mm -hmm. anything, you're building a trust relationship and that trust will be strengthened or weakened over time. We haven't, we've never caught a sponsor lying to us mm -hmm. or showing us things that didn't make sense. It's always, we've always been able to understand the data. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the big thing is when you, when you have a number of creators, you have leverage. So we talk so about back, things back like, collective action we were talking right, about. right. You look at, at uh, like the guilds in Hollywood, the Writers Guild, the Directors Guild, the Screen Actors Guild. Mm -hmm. The, the power that they have is that if you want to work with writers, there are rules that you have to follow. Okay. As a writer, you can't sign a deal outside of WGA rules mm -hmm. according to negotiated terms. And you can't work in Hollywood as a writer unless you're in WGA. You don't get to be in a movie unless you're SAG, right. Screen Actors Guild. And if you do things, or if you take less money, or if you go outside of what the SAG-approved guidelines are, you get in trouble. Mm -hmm. So the studios know that if they do things that are untoward uh, to a certain group of writers, because they could get away with it, then the big writers will be required to take action along with the little ones. That is collective action. Everyone working together. You don't screw right. one writer over, you're screwing all of the writers over. You're not negotiating one deal, you're negotiating the, the, the terms of all deals. Mm -hmm. Like this is the, the foundational stuff. And you know, there can be additional things for a, a given writer or a given project, but like bottom line, here are the rules. We don't have that. For every one of us, there's a hundred thousand YouTubers out there mm -hmm. who can do whatever the hell they want. So what do you do if when you say no, a sponsor can just go to any of them? Right. So much easier to get data in the first place when you have 180 creators behind you and you can say, the only way you get to work with this group of creators mm -hmm. who are demonstrated high performers is if you play ball. Right, and we tend to, uh, there are certain genres in which like, if you want to sponsor creators in that, uh, within that genre, you kind of have to come through us. Right. And so we put down the thing, gavel? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, we, we put down our foot and say, here's the way in which we work. Right. And we don't go in and yell at them and say, all right, but you better share data, yeah. or we're gonna be mad never going to work with you. It's so much simpler than that. They, they come in, we have a conversation, we explain how we work and how important the data is, mm -hmm. how, much, how much value that can help to bring them. We're going to help you understand the portfolio of creators that you're booking, mm -hmm. and we're going to help you understand how those numbers can go up and down over time. It's going to save you a bunch of time and effort. This is good for you, and the long-term relationship is good for the creators. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we've hit a point now where more often than not, the answer is like, yeah, that sounds great. So it's much more like, let's build a partnership. Yeah. And, and if you're going to have a productive partnership, then each side of the partnership needs to know what's going on. Any relationship is a partnership. Right. Ideally in this space. Uh, when creators collaborate together mm -hmm. to make something, that collaboration is a form of partnership. Right. When creators hire people, their team, that's a form of partnership. When creators work with an agency, that should be a partnership. When mm -hmm. creators work with a sponsor, that should be a partnership. If at any point 
these relationships are imbalanced and they fall out of being partnership, then you should look at why that is right. and address what needs to change here so that this can be a partnership. Because you can get a sponsor to come in and pay you more than you're worth. Mm -hmm. And you will have a sponsor. You yep. will not have a partner. And for some people cycling through sponsors, fine. They don't need partners. Those people may eventually get very frustrated with the lack of new partners mm -hmm. available to them. Or they may see that the, the landscape underneath them has changed. In the beginning, they were getting overpaid. And now, two, three years in, they're asking for that same number or inflating it. And they're actually getting underpaid relative to the value they could have delivered. Right. And if you don't have the data, you don't know. I'll add a little bit here on the creator's perspective. Ever since I started doing brand deals, I've always wanted it to be like a win, win, win every time. So like number one has to be win for the audience. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Like the audience is, is the partner as well. And if it's not a slam dunk for them, you know, Raid Shadow Legends could come and say, I'm going to give you a million dollars for a sponsorship. And I'd say no, because it's not a win for my audience. Mm -hmm. Like I literally don't care. I have enough faith in myself that I can make the money I need to make without selling my audience out and throwing them under the bus. Is this sponsor a logical next right. step? But beyond that, like win for the audience, win for me because I'm getting paid my fair rate, but mm -hmm. it has to be a win for the brand too. Yeah. Like, and I'm a business now too, like I sell products, so I'm on the other side. Like if I'm gonna work with influencers to help me sell my products, I want them to see the relationship the exact same way. I do not want them to be like, oh, here's the talking points, let me just read them to the camera, check off the boxes and take my paycheck. I want someone who's going to be like, all right, well, I am now a marketer for this product and I'm going to do as good of a job as I can. Yep. And that is extended to um, me sending critique on talking points or me literally, like I redesigned landing pages for sponsors because I'm like, your landing page is bad. Yeah. You're not going to get conversions if I send my audience to this landing page. It's also so, good for you. More conversions, more money. Right? Yeah. So that's, I've always thought as like, why wouldn't you want to give me the data? Because if you give me the data, it's not like I'm gonna, you know, be like, haha, let me take more money because I'm, you know, I'm overperforming. It's cool. Like I should be paid better if yeah. I'm overperforming. But if I'm underperforming, give me the data so I can see what I can improve the next time around. Right. And if I have the data on 10 different spots and I can see these two did really well, well, now I know how to write my ads for all my future videos. If somebody says, well, I'm only gonna take a hundred thousand dollars, and you know, they they can get somebody to pay that. At, at some frequency, they're gonna feel like a winner. Mm -hmm. Except if they had just started at 50 and built those relationships and learned from the data, then two years later, instead of still getting 100K per, they might be at 200K per. Yep. And then what does that extend to in the future? And what are those relationships? The other thing, and I keep saying this, and I don't mean to infantilize, but uh, YouTubers tend to be a younger group of mm -hmm. people without a ton of professional experience. It's, it's easy when you're in your 20s to miss the fact that the people that you're working with today at these sponsor companies, these are people who are in the creator economy. Mm -hmm. These are influencer marketing professionals. Yep. You are an influencer doing influencer marketing. Do you think that this is the last interaction you'll ever have with this person? Exactly. Do you think that nobody who you burn bridges with will ever be in a position to help you again? You have to build these relationships because if you think you're still a YouTuber in 10 years, you should probably rethink how you're playing the game. Yeah, I mean, careers are long. Mm -hmm. I, I'm slowly becoming a programmer. The world is <laughs> much smaller There's, than you think. There are people I went to school with and I became a YouTuber and I'm like, I can't see how I would work with this person now, but like, now I'm 32 and I'm like, oh, I might be able to actually do something with that person now. 10 years into the career. I don't like burning relationships mm -hmm. in uh, on any front because there's like the process, the role, the individual. Right. Is this a, a thing where I'm okay with the process not working out between us? Mm -hmm. I'm okay with our roles not being a match. I don't wanna do anything where as people, you avoid working with me in the future. Right. Uh, I'm not a fan of venture capitalists. Mm. Um, that, like, I, I don't, uh, coming from the software industry, I've, I've never wanted to be part of that culture. I've never had a good experience with it. And now I see venture capitalists doing stuff in, uh, with creator economy businesses and it makes me really itchy. However, I have friends who I know from one thing or another who are doing the venture capital thing now. And my responsibility is not to say, well, you're awful, you're terrible, burn. 
or I'll work with sponsors who are VC backed. And I'm not going to go in and say, well, because you're VC backed, you must be terrible. Right. We can set aside these differences. We can have interesting conversations and we can build stuff or maybe it doesn't work out and we don't want to build things. Mm -hmm. But understanding that this person who's a, a VC bro and coming to me wanting to do thing A today, I don't need to be a jerk to this person mm -hmm. because chances are one of the companies they invest in could do something really interesting or could want to reach out to our creators and having a positive relationship means that person will probably be more likely to think of me and say, hey, let's get some stuff together with this thing that I'm working on. Yep. This actually happens all the time. People that I worked with 10, 15 years ago hitting me up because like, hey, you're in this space now. I'm doing a thing. What do you think of this? And then new opportunities can be forged out of that. When you go around and every single sponsor you talk to is you taking a $100,000 check when you should have gotten a $50,000 check and all of those people are like, yeah, that was not worth it. Right. Do you want everyone in town <laughs> to have the idea, the, the image that they have in their head of you is that you weren't worth it? Right. Damn. That will pay off. Yep. Just not in the way you want. Right. So win, 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 like triple win is what it has to be. Uh, okay, so we talked a lot about the collective bargaining here. And, and one point I will make on the collective bargaining before we, or I guess collective Action. intelligence actually. Uh, I, I talked earlier about how, you know, if a sponsor is actually sharing data and I can see two spots that did very well, that compounds when you have a collective because we all talk and maybe one person's like, hey, I tried this for this brand and it worked like gangbusters. I can take that as a data point and try it myself. And maybe it doubles my rate or something. Mm. Uh, that's useful as well. So. Yeah, I, I think that uh, talking earlier about consultants and strategy coaches and courses and all of this, most of those people, from what I've seen behind the scenes and in things they've shown in public, most of what they do is repeat things that they've heard other people say, mm. either on Twitter or that they, they took a class, now they feel like they're an expert and they want to pass on the class thing. I see a lot of conversations behind closed doors amongst creators and the things that they share with one another. And then I see coaches going out, coaches who I know have friends within that group, mm. going out and saying things that I've heard creators say. So I have to imagine that what you really want is not a coach or a consultant, what you want is better friends. Yes. What you want is a community. What you want is to be part of a group of people who are sharing that information. Mm -hmm. Because these coach people, uh, however, however lovely they might be and however altruistic their intentions may be, uh, the information they're getting is not like, it's not mined from the earth's core. Yeah. Uh, it, is, it is forged in experience. Mm -hmm. And that experience comes from a collection of creators going through these things and then sharing that knowledge. Yep. Or it comes from relationships with the platform where the people who are you know, pulling the levers and building the machine will communicate how it works. Mm -hmm. And collecting the, the data and the experience and um, learning the tools over time is a thing that a community does. Mm -hmm. Even in our case, so much of what we know is because we are a collection of creators. Yep. And when you're a collection of creators and you all talk to each other, that can lead to tribal knowledge. So like, check your work. But if you've got a strong community of creators who have found success, chances are there's gonna be some really interesting nuggets of information there. Yes. And the stronger the community, over time, the more you'll be able to like verify that this concept works. Like early on, one of the things that we learned, which is default practice now, is if a video is underperforming, try changing the thumbnail. And we thought in the early days that the magic was somehow when you change the thumbnail, it resets the algorithm. That's tribal knowledge bullshit. We really <laughs> thought that. I've said that. that to people. The reality that we know now is when you change the thumbnail, people see a better thumbnail and they're more likely to click it. Yep. When you take a second swing at a thumbnail, you're not just making it different, you're probably making it better. Mm -hmm. You're making a thumbnail with the knowledge that nobody clicked the first one. So even if you aren't going out of your way to make a better one, you're probably still making a better one. Of course that's gonna bump it up. There's also a huge value in being part of that community long term. Like we used to believe that you need to turn AdSense off mm -hmm. for sponsorships to work. And that might have actually been true. It definitely at was one at time. the time. What we don't know is when it stopped being true. Right. So like if you're not part of a community that's constantly doing the work, 
then you might get a piece of advice that was true at one given mm-hmm. time, and then you just go on thinking it's true forever. Yep. And in this case, maybe you keep AdSense off forever and you're throwing money away. Yeah, in the early days, we had plenty of uh, data science evidence to show that videos with AdSense on performed uh, weaker than mm-hmm. videos with AdSense off. What we've since learned is, uh, one, I think the market matured, but mm-hmm. two, the tools have matured a little bit, and now what you can do is you can manually place ads and you can make sure that none are placed within two minutes of the sponsor read. Yep. Because again, logical next step. If you get to where the ad read's about to start and an AdSense ad kicks in, and then when it comes back, it's into sponsor read, nobody's standing around for that. I guess there's like a quotable here. Like if you're in a changing meta and you're hanging out with people who aren't playing the game, you're just gonna have old information. Uh, or you're paying coaches with the hopes that they're in the communities for you. Yeah, and hopefully they're getting updated information and they're sharing accurate information and it's it's not, you know, with an ulterior motive that's not good for you. No, and, th- and there's plenty of really great resources out there mm-hmm. today um, following uh, our friend Rene Ritchie, the creator liaison, I think yep. at creator liaison on Twitter. He's always sharing nuggets and he works very closely. He's, he's a YouTube employee mm-hmm. and he's also one of our creators, one of our owners. So he is a person who I've known for well over a decade. I trust the guy with my life and I know that he has insight into the YouTube machine that I can't. Yep. He's in meetings that I'm not gonna be in. And so when he says the thing works like this, I have zero reason to believe that he's lying to me. Mm-hmm. He has no in- incentive to lie to me. Yeah. His goal is to try to share information. So when I tell people, go follow Renee and listen to what he says, or uh, follow, um, there's a handful of accounts we want to put in the description, but like uh, following Todd, yep. the guy who runs the algorithm. Todd will definitely be in the description. <laughs> if, 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 uh, if you want to know how the YouTube algorithm works, I recommend you follow the guy who's in charge of it. Mm-hmm. And when he says, rep- when you're concerned about uh, alg- like the algorithm doesn't like this or doesn't like that, replace the word algorithm with the, the word audience, that's not a hand wavy bullshit thing he's doing. Mm-hmm. He's telling you how the machine works. You can choose to ignore that at your own peril, and yeah. I've certainly seen people do that. Uh, or misunderstand what that means, like take it in bad faith. But if you if you take a step back and look at the resources and collect all the information and, and parse what that means to you and have conversations with other creators about what it means to you, what it means to them, how do these things apply to your particular situation, getting context and perspective outside of yourself and your channel, uh, this is how you grow. Getting into a group of people who are playing the game and if you can get a person or a group of people in that group of yours who are playing uh, a different game with another part of the industry, say like an agency who are working directly with brands and getting actual conversion data, or you're uh, at least listening to, if not building relationships with people who work at YouTube, like the, the more your network grows and the more you get qualified people who are at the top of their game in your network, the better information you're gonna have. So whether or not you sign with an agency, like be building that network of active players. Yeah, it, it's, it would be easy to say, well, sure, you can say that because you're a successful creator. Mm-hmm. Of course you know. We weren't born knowledge of who, right. uh, but, but you know what creators love? Talking to other creators. Mm-hmm. You know what creators love? Watching YouTube videos. Every year when it's not COVID, Uh, we go to uh, Anaheim for the VidCon thing, and it's always like, oh, I'm gonna meet up with so-and-so. Or you go to an event and two people meet each other, and you're like, oh, I love your videos. I watch your stuff all the time. As contemporaries, as peers, as colleagues, Mm -hmm. people say this to each other. If, like, whatever level you're at, I mean, if you're getting any views at all, if you've made more than a couple of videos, chances are someone in the room has seen your stuff. Reach out to creators. Yep. Say like, hey, I really, really love your stuff. I'd love to chat. I'd love to pick your brain on something. Mm-hmm. This is not like a walled garden. I wish I had known that early on. I think uh, it might not have been as true then, but certainly now, like the the best and brightest creators I know are really into talking to other creators mm-hmm. and like building that community because the creators who I would consider best and brightest now. Uh, from anyone that we work with up through Jimmy, uh, one thing they have in common is they recognize that the small creator who wants to chat with you today 
is going to be the creator who's who's lapping you tomorrow, mm -hmm. and you're going to wish you'd made a friend. So to sort of wrap this section up before I go into the next big thing that I think a lot of people are going to want to know about, uh, I had started building like a list of things people should look for in agencies. You had said, you know, buy-in, are they serving you? Uh, and I think that's all very important. Like, are they building this long-term partnership with you? What are the markers when you get the pitch? Like, what are the questions you should ask? And we have already mentioned, like, you know, the rolling contract. What's the actual uh, uh, commission they take? Is that the same for all creators? Are there any other things that people should be specifically looking for? Are you getting data from the sponsors? Okay. Do you have a real relationship with the sponsors? What is the relationship like with your creators? Uh, what does the contract look like? And can I talk to the folks you work with now? Okay. I, would, I would say to any creator that we are in talks with, uh, whenever they'll mention like, oh, I know so-and-so who works with you. And usually the, the, the conversation ends with like next steps, we'll send you the contract, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I always say, you know X person, go talk to them. Whatever they say about us, that's true. Mm -hmm. Whatever their experience, it's true. Every word, I cosign. And if somebody says, I'm, you know, if they don't know any of our folks, but, but they say, um, like, I'd love to chat with this person or that person, I'll reach out to that creator and say, do you mind if I make an intro? And then it's always like a, add, move me to C, uh, BCC, mm -hmm. have an honest conversation. Whatever you say goes. Uh, that doesn't happen as much anymore because all of our creators come in through creators. Yeah. So there's, there, there's always, there's always a, a, a pre-selected um, uh, introduction. Mm -hmm. But the, the important part to me is that we don't work with somebody who hasn't, we wouldn't want to work with anybody where we wouldn't be comfortable with that person sharing their experience. Gotcha. If there's anyone we work with who I wouldn't feel good about them telling somebody else a story, then we need to fix that first. Right. So if you're going to go work with, if you're going to go sign with an agency, you're thinking about signing with an agency, talk to the other creators on the roster. Mm. Not just one or two that the agency cherry picks for you to talk to. Like, talk to people who are like you, roughly at your level, roughly your genre, see what their experience is like. Do you think it's important for an agency to publish their entire roster? Yes. Okay. So there's another thing. The agency should show everyone they're working with, not just yeah. a few magnet creators or something. Yeah, because if uh, if you aren't able to publish the list of creators, why not? Mm -hmm. Is it because you don't actually have contracts with these people and you don't have the right to share a list because they're not actually your client? Right. Uh, or is it because they wouldn't necessarily want to be associated with you? Or is it because you're trying to jealously guard your client list so nobody can come and poach them? Mm -hmm. In which case, if that's possible, then maybe your relationships aren't that strong. Right. We have from day one always published our entire client list. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to come and try to poach somebody, like, come try. Yep. We'll, we'll hear about it and we'll have to like make a better offer, mm -hmm. right, if it comes down to that. Um, I don't know what that would look like in this case, but, you know, because everybody gets the same contract. But, like, we would have to reevaluate the relationship and how we're approaching it versus um, you're here because you're not allowed to leave. Right. So if everyone's allowed to leave whenever they want to and our list is public, you could come try and poach and people don't leave, why must that be? One would assume that it is because the relationships are strong enough. And if for anyone we work with, that isn't the case, we need to go and fix that. We need to rebuild that relationship and, and add um, uh, strength. Right. So uh, for a creator looking for, uh, I feel like I'm selling us. <laughs> Not what I want to do. Uh, if, you're, if you're looking for someone you, should, you might want to work with, um, look at the strength of their relationships and look at how resilient those relationships are designed to be. Another one that I would add and I don't know how you could evaluate this, probably through talking to other creators, but uh, make sure the agency will go to bat for you. If, say, a brand is asking for too many revisions, mm -hmm. or they're like, it hey, be in the contract, really. yeah, stuff that like needs to be in the contract, like will they go to bat for you and enforce the contract, but also, you know, if a brand is doing something that is uncool, are they getting in front of it? Are they handling it for you? Or are they sort of just stepping aside and being like, figure it out? And is there enough relationship there that you can be flexible on either side? Mm -hmm. There's certainly been cases where a sponsor has come back and asked for something, and it was, 
technically outside of scope, but it was early enough, or it was a re actually this is a pretty good idea, maybe we should do this. And we'll go to the creator and we'll say like, it's probably a good relationship move, and it probably really right. would help this thing. You don't have to, you can say no, but like, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Like, I would do it, what do you wanna do? And most of the time, the creator's like, yeah, I may as well, just do it. Yep. Like, you know what, I, I can add that line, no problem, it'll take me two minutes, mm -hmm. or I can cut that thing out that's kind of confusing, not a problem at all. Not about revision, uh, or it's not within the revision round thing, it's more of like a side request because that wasn't part of the talking points, but like, oh, hey, would you mind? Sometimes you just do that because it's a nice thing to do. Right. And if everything is super rigid and there's no relationship, then you don't get to like navigate that in the same way. Yeah, so again, it's going back to the win-win-win. Yeah. And, and you sort of acting as a partner for the brand. Yeah, similarly, I would say uh, we, have, we have had creators referred to us by sponsors. Sponsors have told creators, like, mm -hmm. you should go work with those guys. It's a great fit. Mm -hmm. um, not, not as a matter of selling us, but, like, that relationship should be there, and it should be strong right. enough that, like, everyone feels good about it. Mm -hmm. And on the sponsor side, there should be a little bit of tension, but not that much. Mm -hmm. um, the other big thing I would say is look at genre. If someone is a prank video creator or a beauty vlogger, like, there's a, a, a ton of genres of YouTube content that we would not serve well at all. Right. And sometimes we get, like, for whatever reason, a week or two ago, I got a bunch of emails from Minecraft video creators. Okay. It's like, that's not what we do. Yeah. It's not a good fit. Best of luck to you. They should have gone and looked for an agency that specializes with that kind of creator mm -hmm. because they're going to understand that kind of relationship and what yeah. those creators will need and the sponsors that uh, would be best suited for those sorts of creators. We serve a collection of genres mm -hmm. expanding over time, but you, know, you can't, can't get everything. I think that's an important po uh, point to make. Like, we have a lot of creators, we have a lot of relationships, but we can't have every relationship and we can't understand every niche perfectly. Right. So there's gonna be other players that are gonna serve other niches better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it goes. Yep. Like, <laughs> we, we just can't be everything to everyone. Yeah, I've, I've certainly had conversations with like VTubers uh, and with, with beauty uh, uh, creators, those are people who like, they're awesome and we have great conversations, but I look at their, their business and it's like, I don't know how to add as much value for you as I could for somebody who makes logistics videos right. or video essays about movies. Mm -hmm. You're doing a different thing. Our machine isn't built for that. So like, let's be friends and keep sharing information because I'd love right. to learn from you, but I don't want to put you in a position where we're promising you a thing we can't deliver. Gotcha. So another big one, make sure that the agency understands oh, yeah. your niche. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if a Minecraft YouTuber comes to us, I'm just like, I don't know what you are. Yep. <laughs> well, there's like, there's uh, like kids content can mm -hmm. be uh, animation. Animation content sort of verges uh, on the edge of this where when the primary audience for a channel is young, very young people, how does that audience even respond to a sponsor? Right. Can you get sponsor dollars when your audience is, and like analytics will say it's all people who are 35. It's like, yeah, because their parents' YouTube account, they're yeah. 30. <laughs> uh, so you can't really trust the data on that, but you you just know, right? Mm -hmm. There's things you can triangulate. How do you, how do you serve that audience? Yep. How do you serve the creator for whom their audience is like eight years old? Exactly. It's I tough. don't know. I don't know. So people who are intentionally making content for children, I wouldn't know how to help that creator. Okay. So there's a group of creator who either they don't want to sign with an agency or they're not there yet. Um, I happen to know creators who are in very, uh, you know, small niches, like how to take care of your pool. My friend Matt runs the biggest pool care channel on the internet. Uh, would he be able to sign with an agency? Maybe, maybe not. Would he be able to go and pitch a brand directly who sells robot pool cleaners on a brand integration? Almost certainly yes. Um, so for that group of people, but also maybe for the group of people who are going to sign with an agency and um, they're trying to pri they're pricing their first spot, like how do you price your first spot? We've talked a little bit about how you want to err on the side of maybe a little lower than you're worth so you build a strong first impression and you can help, you know, make that relationship broad blossom, but how do you even land on what your rate should be in the first place? Err on the side of not charging too much, not err on the side of charging too little. If you have to choose between one or the other, then right. undercharging is better for a relationship. Are you maximizing for today dollars 
or tomorrow dollars. Yeah. So, so to be clear on that, I'm not advocating right. that anybody get intentionally underpaid. Yeah, don't undersell yourself. But if you're like, say you're like, I'm not sure if 10K is right, like go for nine versus 11. But if I'm brand new to this and I'm like, I don't know if I'm worth 10,000 or 1,000. Yeah. Like what sort of markers can we look at to set that initial pricing? Bad version, terrible metric, but you got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. If you're pulling in about 100,000 views per video and you're not on camera, about $1,000 is not a bad place to start. Okay. If, and everything's a flow chart, uh, if you have an audience, not the audience, you're not getting 100,000 viral views per video, but you've got like 20% views from subs and you've got a decent amount of returning viewers, um, then yeah, sure, like thousand dollars per hundred thousand why not okay uh if you're on camera you can probably go higher if you've got a really attached audience and a strong patreon and you've been doing this for a little bit then a hundred thousand views might be worth five thousand dollars it might even be worth ten mm -hmm. but looking at how strong how strongly do you believe that the audience who watches your videos does it on purpose mm. and how much do you think those people care about you if you've got a strong Patreon and you're making money there, assume that those people do care and they're watching you on purpose. Okay. Charge more. But as a bottom line, here's a place to start, $10 CPA or CPM-ish. Okay. It's a bullshit number. And for people who don't know, CPM is cost per 1,000 views. Yes. Cost, cost per, per mil. mil. Yeah, cost per mil. That's price per 1,000 views. Uh, a $10 CPM for sponsorships is not the answer, mm -hmm. but if you need a lump of clay that you can shape into the right answer, it's a lump of clay. Yeah. And I guess to provide people with like, I feel like giving people numbers that other people had is not necessarily the best thing because they're gonna anchor toward it. But like with my channel, we eventually got into a rhythm where my videos would get between one and 200,000 views and they were basically always worth 10 to 12K. Mm -hmm. But I started, my first ever sponsorship was 4K and they wanted a full integration. So I did like a mid-roll ad and they wanted a video that was very, very tightly uh, about skill acquisition because mm -hmm. it was Skillshare. And then the first spot I ever did with you was 2K for ad at the end of the video. It, you know, maybe my, my audience was worth 10K per video back then and I took two, but obviously it quickly scaled up and we, we converged on the right rate. And yeah. then it stayed there and I had 10 grand per video four times a month coming in for like five years. Yeah, uh, are, you, are you mining or are you farming right. these relationships? If you're mining the relationship, ask for a giant absurd dollar amount. Right. And I've seen, I, I mentioned this earlier, but I, I've seen a community of creators where they had one person go in and ask for 30K on a 1 million view guarantee mm -hmm. and get it. And then because that worked, somebody else did the same thing and mm -hmm. they were able to get it. And maybe a third person did it. And now it's like, okay, well, if that worked three times, the answer must be $30 CPM. And so within right. that community, everyone defaulted to anytime they would do anything with the sponsor, they would price it at $30 CPM. Mm -hmm. And so they had a spreadsheet with all of the deals they'd done proving that brand deals should always be $30 CPM. Right. When all they've proven is the brand said yes to a $30 CPM three times. <laughs> yep. That's not science. Okay. Uh, so if you're, if you're a voiceover channel and you have 20% views from subscribers and you're still relatively new at this, $1,000, so a $10 CPM, mm -hmm. $1,000 for 100K views, sure. If you're on camera, highly parasocial, um, giving lifestyle advice and you get lots and lots of comments and engagement, you've got a really strong Patreon, ask for more. Do you think Patreon should be used as a stepping stone to brand deals? I think that it's a good metric. I will often look at, uh, if a creator has a Patreon, I'll look at how well it's doing. Mm -hmm. And if it's a large dollar amount or a large number of patrons, it's like, okay, there might be some there there. 
Mm-hmm. This is somebody who can like activate an audience who cares about them. That's interesting. If they have no Patreon, I don't know, I can't tell you anything. Or if they have a Patreon where it's like a, a barely watered plant and there's a, a relatively low number of patrons yeah. or a small dollar amount, it's like that could be that they've just not put any effort into it or it mm-hmm. could be that the audience doesn't love them. There's no clear if this, then this, then this correct answer mm-hmm. here. There just can't be. Yeah, I mean, Every, we're talking about the widest breadth of content in the world and, right. and many potential different advertisers. So there's, there's no real answer here. Yeah, it's, it's like uh, how much should dinner cost? Right. <laughs> no other information, <laughs> just how much should you pay for dinner? How much, should, how much should a meal cost? Right. Well, am I having dinner or is it like, like am I having dinner at 7? Am I having mm-hmm. dinner at like 5 p.m. like an old person? Am I having dinner at McDonald's or am I having dinner at a Wolfgang Puck restaurant? Right. A lot I don't know. And even from a a McDonald's in um, New York City versus a nice restaurant in uh, rural Kansas Mm -hmm. or a McDonald's in rural Kansas versus a nice restaurant in New York City, (laughs) these things like location matters and and there's like a million factors here. You can't, there's no one single answer that can that can explain it. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to lead anybody to believe that that I think that there's here's what you do. A lot of it is instinct. A lot of it is like Mm -hmm. you look at it and you kind of feel it out. But ultimately, err on the side of relationship. Is this somebody that you want to be working with later? Right. And if, this, if it's a good sponsor that you would like to build a relationship with, go in and say, I'm willing to bet on you. Mm-hmm. You share information about how well I perform, I'll start low. If you give me that information, and if I overperform, we make it up on the next one. I like that a lot. So I think that actually is, is the perfect answer. Uh, and I will ask my follow-up question anyway, but I like the answer being, let's start low. We can use your metrics as like, the bare bonest of frameworks, but let's make a partnership. And if I overperform, let's make it up in the next one. I love that. You and I, and that's are basically what we've done. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So I wanted to ask you, <laughs> how do you feel about affiliate marketing as a way to get data before you go pitching brands on on prepaid deals? Again, uh, it d- depends on genre, depends on creator, depends on the affiliate, mm-hmm. depends on uh, God, so many things, but. The audience is savvy, and they have recognized that there is a type of sponsor, and there's a collection of sponsors, and this means something. Seeing Squarespace over and over again, seeing Skillshare over and over again, they became a mark of quality. Mm. I remember, uh, I think it was Sarah Zed, 100% Natural Respect Women Juice. Uh, The first sponsorship she ever did was Audible, Mm. and there was concern, right? Like there There were one or two comments on that video about like, you took a sponsorship, you sold out. Mm. And there was a moment of like, oh God, right? But then you look through all the comments. Let's just, let's just command F for the word audible. You go through the list and it was, it was like two or three complaints and then dozens, literally dozens like, oh my God, you've been sponsored by Audible, now you've made it. Right. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. The audience associated the sponsorship with a mark, an external mark mm. of quality. Like a band getting signed to a record label in this new weird right. creator economy. There's no governing body. So the external mark of quality, the seal of approval, mm. has to come from somewhere. It's like some of these brands are seals of approval. Right. If you know, in the same way that the trust relationship is, I see on your videos every time you've always got a quality sponsor that's relevant to my interests, even if it's not relevant to me. Right. Relevant to your audience. There's always a logical next step component. There's always a, I believe in you. Mm -hmm. The sponsorships that you run on your channel, you're holding up a mirror. Here's how I see you, audience. And if that mirror is distorted and I don't like what I see, I can start to mentally, psychologically self-select out. Right. If you say to your audience, I think you're a person who wants to better yourself and I'm going to show you products for people who want to be better. I might think to myself, I don't want that product but I am a person who wants to better myself. If you show me, hey audience, I think you're a dipshit rube and you'll buy any fucking thing I sell you because I got paid, I'm gonna think, well, I'm not a dipshit rube. <laughs> Maybe this guy's just a sellout prick. Right. And that's gonna build over time. That, that, that trust relationship matters, but it also goes the other way. If I'm used to seeing quality videos that end with a Skillshare ad, mm-hmm. 
if I'm used to seeing quality videos that end with a brilliant ad, I know that there's an association there and I will, right. as much as I'm learning to trust you, the creator, I'm also learning to trust that brand. Mm -hmm. That brand is now a mark of quality. So when I see brand I know, sponsor I know, creator I don't, it flows the other direction. So if you can get some of that juice out of the squeeze from an affiliate deal, good. That, that can be something. But the audience is savvy enough to know that that link is going to be sponsor.tld slash creator name. And if what you put in there is affiliate dot garbage links slash robot do vomit, that. then... <laughs> Make your own redirects. <laughs> right. Uh, but even then, uh, there's, there's markers. Uh, and it's a, yes. a sponsor that nobody has heard of before, or it's a weird product that doesn't do this kind of marketing, and you're just kind of making up your own read based on whatever you think might work. Again, the audience is savvy. They're going to pick up on a read that is from talking points that is polished versus a read that is just somebody making something up because they want to try to sell you a vacuum cleaner because they'll get the right. best commission on that vacuum cleaner. Approach it as if it's something worth researching. Mm -hmm. Uh, look for the logical next step component. I don't like affiliate marketing because it is infinitely beneficial to the company with the product. But it can be infinitely beneficial to the creator as well. Yeah, there's some definitely over here and a little bit of maybe over here. It's definitely good for them and it's thing. maybe good for you and that imbalance right. I don't like. So I, I guess there's, there, there's like a context here that I kind of want to get to which is like, is using an affiliate relationship purely as a way to kind of gauge like how many conversions can you get in order to bring data to sponsors you're pitching on, on prepaid sponsorships. Is that worth doing in a similar way to using Patreon? Because you can literally see like earnings per click. You can see conversions. Like in the affiliate world, you know, for all its faults, one thing you do get is very transparent data. So if, if your goal is, or if your scenario here is, before you go and talk to sponsors, you want to collect data so you go and informed. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is good information. I you think, don't think it's good information. I think there's too many variables here. Okay. And you're going to end up either uh, under or overperforming for any of a hundred reasons beyond your control or understanding at this stage. Mm -hmm. And you're going to go to sponsor with maybe good, maybe bad data that may or may not be worse than just going in with a made up number. I guess that could make sense because, like, you could have one piece of content that performs incredibly well for an affiliate that you match well, and you, you go to the general sponsors like Audible or Billion or Skillshare, mm -hmm. and you're like, "Hey, I, to pull an example of my own blog, like, I have got this blog post that made a million dollars on affiliates. <laughs> Can you give me a million dollars?" Like, no. And there, there's just so many factors. There's so many variables over here right. that influencer marketing person over here is not going to. Their world doesn't look like this. Mm. So while this might be numbers for product purchase, then those influencers saying this, the campaign is built differently, the landing page would be built differently, uh, the relationship overall is just a different structure. So when you come over here, you may have just set yourself up to misunderstand how this relationship is going to work. Mm. If you can't get this to happen at all, and you want something, and you're trying to get a sense of whether or not you could move units and do anything interesting or if you are a good sales channel and these people aren't talking to you yet no matter how hard you try, maybe. But mm -hmm. I would argue based on the creator inboxes I've seen, it is really hard to be a creator who's getting any numbers at all who is not getting flooded with yeah. sponsors wanting to talk to you. I would agree with that. So my concern, the reason I'm, I push back on, on uh, affiliate deals is because there are so many sponsors hungry for creators and while you might learn something, anyone's guess as to whether what you're learning is helping or hurting. Okay. That makes sense. Like th this is a world where I have a lot of experience and do make a lot of money on affiliates, but I think that, that there's, I think that there's merit to the fact that you could definitely misinterpret data from this side and try to just carte blanche apply it to this side. Well, your affiliate data history is from a uh, website initially. And then yes. when you do it on YouTube stuff, uh, it's a companion to everything else you're doing. Mm. So you are a much more sophisticated animal 
than somebody who's right. just starting out as a creator. Yep. Your risk reward system is different, your level of knowledge and engagement are different, and your level of relationship with different parties along the chain is different. Mm -hmm. So the assumption that somebody coming in fresh, uh, still green, having your level of sophistication and understanding, I wouldn't give them the same advice I'd give you. That's true. I did do affiliates for about five years before I ever took a sponsorship on YouTube. So that's, and two years of nothing before that. So yeah. seven years of learning a lot before ever getting into this world. And then once I got into this world, like we mentioned earlier, we started with a rate that was like five times lower than where I ended up. Mm. So maybe it's not as useful for, for gauging that. It's worth noting because I'm sure that there's someone somewhere in the comments who will say, this is bad, you started too low, this is why this structure doesn't work, or you're underselling, you're, you're telling people to undersell themselves. The thing that we learned with you, and the reason why I stand by it, is we went in with the objective of build relationship for longevity. Mm -hmm. And then the rate that we landed on was so consistent for so long we don't know. Let's go back to the beginning. Would you have performed at 10 to 12K on spot one? I don't think I would have. Yeah, unless you're really sure of that based on everything. Not just I'm super swell and people love me, but actual mm -hmm. what you know now. Looking back, would you have made that much money for the sponsor that you'd be worth this rate? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, tough to know, but I don't think so. One, one might argue that you could have burned a bridge here mm -hmm. and then become frustrated, try again somewhere else, and now our relationship becomes frustrated because nobody's yep. taking the bait at this number, and eventually things dissolve, and you're out there doing a, uh, a sponsor deal on every third or fourth video instead of on every video. Because mm -hmm. when we say 10 to 12K per video, that was every week. It was every week, and it actually goes further than that. So I, I recorded this bit in a voice note to myself, and I want to bring it up back again. Um, so for Skillshare in particular, I believe they were my biggest sponsor. I think so. Uh, and, and to tell people, like, I'm saying were because I, I stopped doing sponsors because I started selling my own products, mm -hmm. which happened to perform a lot better. You know, it turns out audience fit is very good when you're selling your own products. Logical next step. But they were my biggest sponsor, and I want to say I made around 400 k from sponsorships from Skillshare. Through the relationship that we built with Skillshare, working with you, I was able to make original courses on Skillshare. Mm -hmm. and, and I had a strategic thought when I went into this. I was like, well, they put a lot more marketing effort into their originals than they do into anything else. Wouldn't it be cool if I was like the face of Skillshare on their homepage or something? Through doing that, I've earned 600000 through course sales on Skillshare. Mm -hmm. So literally more than I was ever paid from sponsorships came as basically passive income after making those courses and just putting them on the platform. A secondary benefit to having right. invested in the relationship. Yes. That came out of the relationship. I don't think it would have happened if I was just like this random guy emailing them out of the blue being like, hey, can you make an original course of me? Yeah, but we'd done this for like, uh, I think it was like at least a year at that point when I did the first one. Yeah, it's the difference between sales and business development. Mm -hmm. There's an operational component here, which is, are you building to maximize revenue in the short term or are you, are you building to maximize revenue in the long term? That, that's the easy part to conceptualize. Mm -hmm. What's harder to, to conceptualize, uh, I, I think, is the way you get to option B, the way you get to long-term success, to sustainability, is not through number hacking. It's through building a relationship here. You're planting a seed. And in planting this seed, you don't know in the beginning what it's going to grow into. Mm -hmm. And along the way, as a, as a YouTuber, really any business, you've got a couple of paths, but as a YouTuber, you can go from point to point to point to point to point, mining as much as you can for right. each of these relationships. And if you're getting returns every time you take out your ax and mine at each of these points, it might feel like you are an expert miner and that you are worth it, mm -hmm. and you will always be this successful because you're that swell, and everybody loves you, and you're special, and there's no one else on YouTube who could do what you do. There's no cheaper version of you that they're going to eventually get. There's no army of 15-year-olds out there wanting to be you and who will eventually get there with more understanding of the creator economy, more understanding of the tools as they develop. You're just going to be that great forever. 
and you just keep mining, keep mining, and if you're lucky, it keeps paying out. Mm -hmm. There are certainly people for whom that's true. The other path is at each point along the way, you plant a seed, you plant a seed, you plant a seed. And the hard part is that you don't necessarily know what those seeds are going to grow into. But when you get to here and you look back at what's grown, it's meaningful. Right. Not everyone is going to be a mighty oak when mm-hmm. you turn around, but you start things start to happen. And then you get here and you look back and even more things start to happen. And in this world, it's not necessarily a straight line. Sometimes you circle back and you revisit some of these points and you get to collect the fruit right. or vegetables or whatever from the, the seeds that you've planted. Mm-hmm. And then that's what builds the sustainability. And when you put a dollar value on that, in the earliest days of mining versus the earliest days of farming, farming might look smaller. Yep. It also might not. But it might. But it might. I, I think that too many people look at this and they think, you're a sucker. Right. Because they don't understand that you're not planting seeds for money trees. The seed that you're planting is not uh, a fruit that you can sell. It's a relationship. Mm -hmm. And this person who's here today, when you circle back, this person might not be here. They might be over here working for a much bigger company with a much bigger budget. And you've built this relationship with them over years. Right. And now you can do bigger, cooler, more interesting shit because this person knows you and trusts you and they get that you can deliver. They understand your value and you understand theirs. And frankly, you understand yours. Mm -hmm. So when you want to go build something cool and the person who used to work here is now heading up the something something division at this big media company, you have an in. Those are the things that I think it's easy to miss when you're young in a career. Right. Not young in age, but young in a career, or young in age, or both. It's still a new industry, and the level of sophistication is growing, and that's cool, but it's too easy to miss the fact that you will get much more in the long run out of farming. Yeah. Farming is sustainable, mining is not. It's interesting to think like this, this whole process of getting brand deals is actually a relationship building process that can be a lot more than just getting 10K for a video. And it is. Like you literally make relationships, you make friends, you meet people. There are opportunities that are going to come out of that. Look at, look at our dots along mm-hmm. the way. We built a relationship with one sponsor. Yep. I mean many, but in one particular case, we built a relationship with a sponsor. And then we built our own little streaming service as a let's have fun and see what this turns into. Mm-hmm. Little side project. And somewhere along the way, it got far enough along that in our friendly conversations with this sponsor, we said, crazy idea. What if we did like a bundle thing? And that they're like, you know what? That sounds pretty interesting. Let's do that. Let's try it. Let's just see what happens. Right. Do you think we can make that happen on day one? No. Do you think we go in with a pitch? <laughs> no, this is like, we're sitting around having a completely different conversation mm-hmm. and the idea happens. And that turns into a, a, a bundle deal that lasts years and now a business of ours making millions upon millions upon millions of dollars for creators yep. and is now one of the biggest sponsors on YouTube in its own right. Do you think mm-hmm. that could have happened if we hadn't gone down this path of building the relationships? Right. Nebula. Yeah is 100% built on relationships in all directions, including the sponsor relationships, including yep. the, the platform relationships. If you don't plant those seeds and then go back and water them sometimes, you don't get stuff like that. So it's much like that, that graph you often see where it's like, you know, employment is like linear and then entrepreneurship can be like this exponential curve. I think we're looking at the same thing here with what is your mindset going into building uh, relationships with sponsors? Mm. Like you said, are, are you farming? Then it, it might be that small in the beginning but exponential in, in the long-term kind of yeah. curve. And if you're looking at it as a miner, you might get more in the beginning, but maybe it's that linear thing or maybe it just peters out eventually. Looking at creators who I respect and admire who are like doing things on their own, but you know, we have conversations about numbers mm-hmm. and I see them mining, they'll, they'll do the thing where they're like, oh yeah, I'm up here. I'm up here, Mm -hmm. I'm up here, I'm up here. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's way better. That's way better, that's way better. Bye. And uh, it's not because they're dumb, it's not because they're a bad person, it's just they they took a different approach. They optimized for this part. Yep. Um, And I I suppose it is possible if you you do things 
right, or if you're fortunate, then you get to build relationships over time. You can do this and then catch that wave of relationships. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that a smart, savvy creator, the trouble is that if you get so much validation from this, it's really hard. It's really hard to justify switching paths. Yep. And we've, we've seen that. We've parted ways with creators who were very much on this trajectory and thought they always would be. Mm -hmm. And then they didn't understand why they couldn't get the sponsor rates that they felt they were worth. Yep. And that's okay. I've got nothing against those people. I've got nothing against their approach to, to building their own business. That's, uh, they're, they're all um, doing cool stuff and I wish them the best. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how to make that sustainable. I don't know yes. how to make mining sustainable. And there's also like a piece of this as a philosophy to what I want to create here. That I have a very specific target audience. Mm. It's the creator who wants to have a long career and who wants to build partnerships. Mm. So like if there's a creator out there who's like, I just want to get the bag mm. as much as possible, I I'm not really making this for them. Right. I don't really want to serve them. You if they change their mind, <laughs> say that. <up> <laughs> I probably will. Like, there's going to be a thesis. It's like you know, I'm, I'm making this cre uh, this video for creators who want to build a sustainable career as a creator, mm -hmm. and part of that is relationships, mm -hmm. and part mm -hmm. of that is is accepting a little bit less than maybe you could get right away to build those long term relationships. You know, you can't serve everyone with what you say. Yeah. yeah. So that's my filter. Farming versus mining, uh, it can look like the same amount of work mm -hmm. for wildly different. Uh, initial returns. I have some lightning round questions for Let's you. Go. Let's go. So, and that means we're going to round up. We're going to wrap up soon, which is probably good. <laughs> um, but I've I, been I think here for hours. We've, we've been doing this for a while. Uh, but like I said, I'm trying to make the ultimate guide. Sorry, what? CPA, CPM. What do those mean? And which should be look? Would which should we be looking at? Uh, if we're talking about AdSense, CPM, sure, why not? Uh, it's cost per thousand views. Cost per mil, CPM, okay. mil being Latin, I think, for thousand. Yep. Cost per thousand. Cost per thousand views. Mm -hmm. uh, CPA is cost per acquisition. That's a sale. When somebody clicks through and they sign up for the thing, they have been acquired. The customer relationship now belongs to the sponsor. Acquisition. Cost per acquisition. That is, uh, they will pay you because they got paid. So that's what we should really be focusing on. That is what the sponsors focus on. Okay. So I would say that's what we should focus on. All right. Um, should I give a brand access to my analytics or screenshots and demographic info when they ask for it? Uh, yes, if they are. Yes, only if they are willing to share information with you. Okay. Tit for tat on that. And only share the information for the video they sponsor. Okay. You can share channel demographics. Like if they say like, yeah, we'll share data with you and they ask for stuff up front, like feel free. Okay. Like you're, you're building trust and that's not keys to the kingdom data. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that'll be table stakes. And sometimes when you're pushing on how important data is, showing a little bit is, is not the worst way to get the conversation moving. Okay. But like don't, if they, if they sponsor a video but won't give you any data, then like what like do they, do. yeah, all right. Uh, should you ask to be paid up front? Should you ask for a deposit or just wait for them to pay you at the end? And um, how, how soon should they pay you? You should have a contract with payment terms okay. and they should pay you when they say they're going to pay you. Paying after is normal. That's customary. It's very rare for a sponsor to pay before it publishes okay. for a bunch of reasons. Um, in terms of accounting, I, I believe you have to book the sale uh, when you publish the video. So if you publish in June but you don't get paid until August, that's a that's a June. Well, that depends if you're doing accrual versus cash. Yeah, that's the whole thing. But, but uh, we usually get it's like net thirty to you. Well, the reason I, I go right. down that path is sponsors will invariably be on accrual base, not on on cash. Right. So they don't care. They will pay you as soon as you invoice, but it has to go through their their, their uh, accounts payable system, mm -hmm. which uh, if there's like a net 30 or net 60, it's not because they're trying to hang on to the money to screw you. It's because that's just how their system works. Gotcha. So make sure you understand what their payment terms are. Okay. And then like, you know, if you have to send a, a polite letter and then a less polite letter, um, and then round three is UCC a lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. I've never, we've never had a sponsor not pay us by lawyer round. Ad placement, we kind of covered this, but pre-roll, mid-roll, always end? Always the end. Logical next step. How about 
quick mention in the early part of the video. Uh, sure, which is great for a disclosure okay. for FTC requirements by saying like, you know, blah, 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 blah. In this video, I'm going to something, something, something. Uh, this video brought to you by the concept of diapers. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, and then at the end, you talk about how great the diapers are. Uh, if, if that's a good fit for your video, mm -hmm. um, cool. Yeah, like letting, letting the audience know that yeah. th this is coming. Uh, and that this is the sponsor, and that's context that might be interesting for them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just like planting the seed in their head. I do that with, with videos where I'm going to pitch my templates. I'll be like, you know, if you want a done for you productivity system, I have it. More on that later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Back into the video. We do a lot for Nebula spots, mostly because the creator can say, like, if you want to watch this video mm -hmm. ad free, here the, the the Nebula link is in the description or whatever, right. because there's an actual value add. Again, logical next step. When you mm -hmm. hear that, you'd be like, oh, click. I want to see this that ads or whatever. Um, right. But generally, like a quick mention of the sponsor, it happens so quickly it's not even worth skipping. It's fine. I think that's, and that's also a context dependent thing. I remember watching a real life lore video where in the beginning he's like, hey, I have a full length companion to mm -hmm. this video. Like that's the kind of thing that's great to mention because now the entire video that the uh, viewer is going to watch is almost an ad for the companion right. on Nebula. But if it's like, hey, let me just do a, a 60 second ad for diapers or away suitcases or whatever it is, that just blocks people from watching the video. Yeah. So it's like, it's different context. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, when you're writing up your contract, how many revisions or like what, what sort of language should you put in there regarding revisions to your spots? I put a time limit on it, more than number of revisions. Uh, okay. Humans only have the ability to send you so many revisions in two business days. Mm -hmm. We've never had, like, our, our contracts say two business days. So it's just we submit within two business days, they have to approve or ask for. Mm -hmm. and, and you have basically two business days to figure it out. Right, because the thing that's not quite stated there but is is implied, and it all like functionally it works out fine, um, but you have two business days in which to make revisions. We are not, the creator is not required to do 100 rounds of revisions, and it takes them as long as it takes them. Right. So you send back notes on, on the first round, the creator implements those notes, we're done. Right. Yeah, and I guess I would add to that, uh, when you're getting a brand deal, make sure that they send you a document with the talking points. That way you can say, I followed your talking points. Here, the Here they are. Yeah. Um, a big part of why you want the approval process is so that they can't come back and say, you didn't do this, right. we're not gonna pay you. Yes. The approval is there more for you than for them. Mm -hmm. They think it's for them but it's more a mechanism for you to say, you approve this. Which we've actually had that happen. We, we had a sponsor uh, come back and say, like the, the boss came in and said, we don't, like this isn't okay, they shouldn't have done this. And we're like, your people approved it. Yep. It's like, they shouldn't have. And I'm like, sucks for you. This has happened with me. Where like the talking points, it, it wasn't like I did a thing that was bad for the brand, but it was like the talking points had mentioned a certain sale they were doing. I said the sale. Two weeks later, they come back like we weren't running that sale. You should like, have got me new talking then points. Send I me the accurate talking points. Follow <laughs> the instructions. Uh, and w while I'm thinking about that, um, I will give a tip. When the sponsor gives you your link, go to the link, and make sure not make sure not only that it goes to the right page. <laughs> check the URL because mm -hmm. I have had multiple times where a sponsor has given me another creator's link that goes to the same landing page and yeah. all of the conversions would have been attributed to that creator. I've had other times where they'll send me one of my old links where you'll see like uh, campaign equals Thomas Frank and period equals November 2020 and it's 2022. And I'm yeah. like, cool, so that's that's just a really old link and I'm gonna get no, you know, your date is gonna get all messed up at, yeah. at the very uh, least. Yeah. So just make sure you check your UTM parameters on there. I think you mentioned that our contract doesn't have terms on how long content has to stay up. Is that something like, as long as it's not in the contract, there is no term, or should you specify? I wouldn't. Okay. It's pretty uncommon for that to even come up now. People expect that YouTube videos are gonna stay up. Mm -hmm. If you're going in after a month and using the YouTube editor to cut out the ad reads, that's a real dick move, and people are gonna catch on because like, while the bulk of your conversions are gonna come in within the first 72 hours and then one week, then one month, et cetera. After a month, you're still getting conversions, especially if you run the same sponsor 
repeatedly over a period of time, mm -hmm. all of those old videos are still stacking conversions in your favor today. Right. If you go back and cut them all out, your today performance will be weaker. So you're just like weakening the overall relationship. So one, kind of a dick move, you shouldn't do that. Two, it'll hurt your numbers. Last question, this is the most fun one. How do you make more money from your sponsorships? How do you raise your rates? Build a better relationship with your audience. Okay. The only way your sponsor rate goes up is if the audience is doing more to signal to the sponsor that it's working. Mm. The only way you're gonna get that is by getting a larger audience and a larger group of people within that audience who will follow through and sign up. That can be better titles, better thumbnails, better storytelling, tighter editing in the first 30 seconds of the video. You should be doing all of those things anyway. Um, a lot of it is making sure that when you run a sponsor, you're running a sponsor that speaks well of how you see the audience. Mm -hmm. And you hold up that mirror, the person in the audience should feel like you see them as a smart, intelligent, attractive person who is capable of doing amazing things and um, isn't going to fall for dumb scams. Right. Like if you're out there selling people NFTs, then your audience is probably going to take you less seriously. You yeah. want to build a relationship you want to build your audience and then build your relationship with your audience. That's how you get more sponsor dollars. How about some of the tactical things? Well, let me rephrase it this way. Uh, assuming you know I've done all this, like I'm picking the right sponsor, I've built a great relationship with my audience, what are some of the mistakes that we see creators make that either you know encourage viewers to not watch the ad or don't pitch the brand well enough? Yeah, uh, giant gaps. Never never leave a big blank spot before the sponsor read and never ever say, thanks for watching. That is uh, it's what we call permission to leave. When you say, thanks for watching, really glad for blah, blah, blah. Uh, thanks so much to my Patreon supporters for making this video possible. And now I want to tell you about this video sponsor. By the time you're done saying thanks, the audience is gone. Right. They know that they can leave now, and they do. Mm -hmm. Not because they're jerks or because they want to bail on you, and you're not tricking them into staying by not doing that, but when you say thanks for watching, that's the end. She's the like, credits have rolled. The credits right. have rolled. Get up and leave. Nobody's being a jerk here. Just the lights came on and the credits are rolling. Mm -hmm. It's time to get up and go. And you can roll the credits. You can say, well, you should stay. Look at like the craft services people. They're really nice. So you should see their names. And uh, sure, you should, but like people don't. Yep. So when you give permission to leave, people leave. If you give people a good reason to stay, connecting the value of the sponsor to whatever you're talking about, mm -hmm. logical next step, uh, then you, you make it part of the content. The difference between an AdSense ad and a sponsor read should not be one has your face, the other doesn't. Right. The difference should be some connection to whatever the hell it is you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you should fully integrate the ad into the video every time, but when you are on camera saying this, or it's your voice, your persona, even if you're getting paid to do it, you're still doing it. Mm -hmm. This is part of your video. It needs to be part of your video. That's the reason it works. So if you're making it an other thing, then the audience will see it as other thing. Right. And they will bail because that's they're here for the video. Mm -hmm. This is other thing. Make it part of the video. One thing that I'll add to that is I try to follow the ADA framework when I'm writing an ad. So it's like get their attention, build the interest, build desire enough for them to go take action. Mm -hmm. And I want to mention that because definitely what you said, like make it part of the video, but some creators will interpret that as, well, I should write a fun song about the sponsor. Or like I've seen Jimmy a couple of times, like uh, a few years ago, do sponsorships where it's like, the brand barely is the focus of the ad read. Mm -hmm. It's like, here's more of the video, and by the way, like this is sponsored by this, and he's gotten much better at that over the years. I think like if you're gonna do a sponsor read, you have to make people care about the sponsor, and you do that by keeping their attention, but then getting them interested in something they care about and tying the brand or the product to that interest, which engenders desire, and that gets them to go actually click and convert. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you want to You want to make clicking on the sponsor link, interesting enough that even if I don't do it, I understand why I would. Right. I would also say before you mention the name of the sponsor, 
I, the audience, should understand the value of the sponsor. Mm -hmm. If you say, I'd like to thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online blah, 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 blah. Meh. Yeah. It doesn't perform very well. If you go in with like, uh, yeah, these are the, 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 these are the 20 best ways to, what was my example earlier? These are the 20 best ways to, uh, the 20 tips for uh, creating videos as a side hustle to earn money. And like when I got started doing this, I did all of my own editing. Like there's a lot of work here, but it doesn't, there's plenty of great tools out there that can help you along that journey. You don't even have to, like you don't necessarily have to go to a fancy video editing school. I didn't. I learned how to edit video by watching tutorial videos, mm -hmm. like the ones you would see on Skillshare. So by the time you land on the word yeah. Skillshare, I already get it. I already know why I want this. Or even better, this editing course. Mm -hmm. Like I literally yeah, took yeah. Ollie's Final Cut Pro editing course mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, being able to say, be, being able to place the value before the name, mm -hmm. the audience will at least respect that there is a purpose to yeah. it. They understand the purpose for this sponsor being a part of this video. Mm -hmm. When you say, and I'd like to think, they're never going to get to the purpose. Nope. They just know sponsor. And again, the audience is savvy. They know some creators will like do, uh, when they start the segue, they'll change the music mm -hmm. underneath. So like little psychological cues to let the audience know that the thing is I did that. Right? <laughs> uh, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's all healthy. It's not, you're not tricking somebody. You're making a point by connecting two things. Yep. In fact, I, I did the music change uh, specifically to kind of indicate like this is the sponsor segment because mm -hmm. I always wanted to make sure like the content of the video is useful on its own. It does not depend on the sponsor, even if the sponsor happens to be a great fit for what I was talking about. Yeah. And, and I think maybe some of that was like me just being overly cautious and I would rather be overly cautious than tarnish my relationship with the audience. Of course. And that that's part of the... the um philosophical and and ethical promise to the audience that builds the trust, mm -hmm. you're not tricking them. You're not saying like, a thing you want, thing you want, ha ha, I tricked you into seeing a commercial. Right. That's toxic. That poisons the relationship. Mm -hmm. What you want is a fair and equitable exchange of you're still paying attention. You knew there was gonna be a sponsor in this video. Yep. That's, you got this video for free. It's in the description, right. probably mentioned up front. Right. Like, you knew this was coming. What I'm doing is I'm ensuring that when we get there, you're not wondering how this has anything to do with anything. Right. By the time we get there, uh, it's like the marshmallow man at the end of Ghostbusters. Like, mm -hmm. if you put that in the first 10 minutes of the movie, it seems silly. Right. But you start out with skepticism, and there's a stack of books. What's going on? And it slowly builds. And by the end, you get to marshmallow man. It's like, oh, yeah, sure, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, you should treat your sponsor reads the same way. Treat your sponsor reads as Marshmallow Man. Yeah, by the time you get to the word, the name of the sponsor, it should be like, okay, yeah, I get it. Mm -hmm. I understand why that's there. Then nobody's thinking, like, oh, you jerk, you tricked me. Yep. In fact, the opposite is true. There was a period of time there when the smooth segue thing was still new where the audience regarded it like a magic trick. Uh -huh. Like, there's the reveal. Like, oh, you got me. I didn't even see that. One. Oh, that's so good. Yep. And see, like, this is the smoothest segue I've ever seen, yeah. dude. They always misspell segue, S-E-G-W-A-Y. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, they, like, the, the audience is savvy. They're smart. They understand how this whole machine works, and they want you to succeed. That's the whole point of the parasocial relationship is that they feel like they know you. They feel like they're on this journey with you. They don't want you to die of starvation and not make videos anymore. They want you to be well-fed mm -hmm. and successful and happy so you keep making the videos that they love so much. And they know if they're not paying money, then ads are part of the deal. Right. And I, I suppose we should emphasize that we have six at least years of plentiful data to show that this is true and this creates sustainable careers. So you will inevitably get one or two people in the comments that are like, ah, oh, whatever, I didn't like the segue, it was too smooth or something like that. Or, or, or they'll be like, oh, there was an ad in this, I hate you. Some that's people are just like, going to complain. Yeah, that's like, I don't know, that's having to clean the bathroom. It's part of, it's part of your job. You're yeah. going to have some people who go into your bathroom and mess it up. Uh, but you still get to run your business and you get to grow it. Yeah, you can try to make everyone happy all of the time and you're going to be very frustrated because it's impossible and you will have sacrificed every opportunity you had to thrive. Right. Okay, I will finally let you go. Oh if, my God. If people want to follow you. <laughs> it's like 8 p.m. You don't need coffee. 
If people want to follow you, if people want to see... We started at five. Three, where should they go? Uh, All right, well, I'll just tell them. Go watch the NDA podcast oh, on yeah, Nebula, if you're on Nebula. Um, uh, if you look me up on on uh, Nebula, it's, it's NDA is the name of my show, where it's kind of like this, but um, I, I talk a little less. Uh, or there's um, my YouTube channel. You can look me up by name. Twitter, at DWiscus. Um, that's probably good enough. Cool. All right, y'all. See you later. Sign up for Nebula. One last little bit of promo for you. If you want to learn how to actually run your creator business, then you may want to follow up this conversation by going and taking my class over on Nebula called Business 101 for Creators. This is a class that will teach you how to structure your creator business, whether to choose an LLC or different business structure, how to deal with business expenses and taxes, how to get organized and build processes, and even how to start hiring people to scale your business. This class is taught by, you guessed it, me and pulls from my over 12 years of running this creator business full time. It's an hour of content. There are a ton of useful tips in there if you are a creator trying to scale your business. And you can watch it right now over on Nebula using my special link in the description down below, which will get you Nebula access for just $2.50 per month, a 40% discount over the normal price. And as far as streaming services go, a pretty darn good deal if I do say so myself. With Nebula Access, you're also going to get access to my new videos from this channel a week early and without ads. You'll get tons of other exclusive content from lots of other great creators, and you'll be helping to support not only my work, but the work of independent creators in general. Nebula is a creator-run and creator-owned streaming service. It is the largest of its kind. We are working to redefine what it means for independent creators to build something truly amazing, and you are really going to want to stick around for some of the stuff we have coming down the pipeline in 2024. So sign up with that link in the description down below. If you do, thank you so much for your support. And even if you don't, thank you for sticking around to the end of this video. I know it is a fantastically long video, so thank you for watching it. Hopefully you found it useful, and I'll see you in my next video.